and it is all yours. Okay, it's uh, 731 on Monday, December 14th, and this is the Wilmette Park District Regular Meeting Board of Park Commissioner. We're going to start tonight with a public hearing, Truth in Taxation, and that'll uh, happen before the regular meeting starts. So I'd like to call to order the public hearing for the 2020 proposed tax levy. Um, the Park Board will now hold a public meet hearing on the 2020 proposed tax levy for the Wilmette Park District. I will call on Executive Director Steve Wilson to explain the reasons for the levy and any proposed increases or decreases in this case. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, before I do that, let me just do a quick roll call vote for the record uh, as a requirement now that we're doing these virtually. Uh, Commissioner Abbott? Here, present. Commissioner Murdoch? Yes. Commissioner Schistler? Yes. Commissioner Clark? Yes. Commissioner Wolf? Yes. Commissioner Goble? Here. Commissioner Anderson? Here. All members of the board are present for the Truth and Taxation public hearing. So. Uh, looking at the 2020 tax levy, uh, and just for clarification, the 2020 tax levy is collected in our fiscal year 2021. Uh, and so uh, looking at it, if uh, there are basically three sections to uh, the tax levy. There are the tax cap funds, then there are the uncapped funds, and then there's debt service. So I'm going to kind of give you the bottom line point of each one of those sections instead of going through all of the details. But ultimately, the tax cap funds are limited by the consumer price index from the prior year. So at the end of 2019, that number is 2.3%. Uh, the uh, tax levy proposed will utilize the full 2.3% uh, as allowed by the property tax uh, laws, uh, making our levy uh, for 2020, five, uh, for these funds, $5,022,692 which is $112,925 more than our tax levy extension from the prior year. Moving down past that and including what's called special recreation, this is the fund in which we uh, uh, tax for and spend out of money to make our facilities and our parks ADA accessible, as well as the money we pay our special recreation co-op, NSSRA, the Northern Suburban Special Recreation Association, for the services uh, and programs that they provide, also the people they provide in our programs to service individuals with disabilities working within our programs. Uh, that dollar amount uh, is actually uh, decreasing this year um, and going from uh, the number it was uh, in the past down to $480,000, which is a decrease of um, uh, about 32%. I'm going off memory. I don't have it written down here. Uh, we then combine that with the uh, tax cap fund for what is considered the ordinance dollar amount. And that is a decrease of 2.06% as compared to the prior year tax levy extension. So we're having a decrease at that level. If our number is over 5% at that number, you're required to do a hearing such as this. Uh, the practice of the park district and of the park board has been no matter what the number is up, down, small, large to do this hearing because it is believed that everyone should have a right to hear and comment about the tax levy. So uh, while we're in a decrease and not obligated to have this hearing, we're, we are having it. Uh, then when we take the number even further to what actually will be on everybody's property tax bills and add in the uh, debt service component to repay the interest and principal of bonds, that number is going down by 22.25% to $2,270,726. Therefore, our overall tax levy will be $7,773,418, which is a decrease of $765,640, or 9% decrease. President Anderson, back to you. Okay. All persons desiring to be heard will now have an opportunity to present written or oral testimony with respect to the 2020 proposed tax levy. First, are there any written or oral comments from the commissioners? Well, I think it just should be noted that um, park district taxes are going down because referendum debt, primarily Malincrot and the pools, um, have been paid off aggressively. The community, the board, the park district have 
pursued a policy of aggressive payment uh, debt reduction. And as a result, uh, the community will see the park districts, uh, you know, the result of that this year, next year, and, you know, the next few years. So um, that's good forward planning. That's all. I would agree. And I wanted to add also, you know, it's possible to pro provide the programming we do as well as reduce taxes when we have a good operating team. And I think that Steve, Emily, Christy, Sheila, and many others um, make hard decisions to be sure we operate the way that we do and in a financially responsible way. So thank you. Well, and picking up on that, I certainly echoing that comment, but also noting that so much of our um, budget is composed of fee income, certainly in normal years and even this past year. Not only that, but also non-residents come in and pay premiums to use our facilities and services, which again allows us to keep the, uh, uh, the burden on the taxpayers low. And I think the Park District represents a tremendous value for the members of our community. Um. And going back to the debt, I believe our high debt was um, about 39 million back when Malacroix was uh, purchased. I think that's the highest that we got to. Currently at a debt load of 6.9 million, I think at the end of this year. Um, so, and shrinking. So, all right. so those are all great comments. All righty, thank you. Are there any written or oral comments from the public? So at this point, when we do a public comment, usually I go around the screen and call on everyone, but this also is not usually something a lot of people have a lot of commentary on. So I'm just going to ask any members of the public who wish to speak to unmute themselves and, and speak at this point, and we'll pause to hear from you. Pause complete. Back to you, Commissioner Anderson. All right. Okay. Can I hear a motion to adjourn the 2020 Truth and Taxation public hearing of the Board of Commissioners. So moved. Second. Thank you. Director Wilson, would you please call the roll? Commissioner Abbott. Yes. Commissioner Murdoch. Yes. Commissioner Schistler. Yes. Commissioner Clark. Commissioner Clark. Yes. Am Commissioner good? Wolf. Yes. Commissioner Goebel. Yes. Commissioner Anderson. Yes. Public right. hearings adjourned. Thank you very much. Now, break, and now <laughs> I declare, I call to order the 2014, I'm sorry, the December 14th, 2020, regular meeting of the Wilmette Park District Board of Park Commissioners. Director Wilson, would you yes. please again. I understand. Take it the seems vote. redundant, but it is a new meeting and we have to do this. Roll call vote for uh, attendance. Commissioner Abbott? Here. Commissioner Murdoch? Yes. Commissioner Schistler? Yes. Commissioner Clark? Here. Commissioner Wolf? Yes. Commissioner Goebel? Yes. Commissioner Anderson? Here. No one has left the meeting. Uh, we still have everyone. All right, that sounds great. Okay, jumping ahead to the third item, the approval of the minutes, starting off with the October 26, 2020 special board meeting. Any, uh, anybody uh, want to make a motion and a second? I'll make a motion. I'll Thank second. you. All right. Any comments on the meeting minutes? Good. Let's Steve, go. I sent you a note earlier today with the clarification on the 75,000. Correct. Uh, j just for everyone's uh, understanding, he was referring to a note in the minutes from our financial advisor, Eric Anderson from Piper Sandler, where we talk about how the debt uh, is a $75,000 obligation. It's $75,000 annually. So we're going to be adding the word annually to clarify that that's the annual responsibility for the term of the repayment of the debt certificates. Thank you very much. That was for the parking lot, right? It's CRC. Um, yes, um, correct, um, correct. Yep, yeah. okay. All righty. Um, could we take a vote to approve the minutes? Sure, Commissioner. Unless somebody else has any uh, questions, no. comments, edits. I'm fine. Great. Commissioner Abbott? Okay. Yes. Commissioner Murdoch? Yes. Commissioner Schistler? Yes. Commissioner Clark? Yes. Commissioner Wolf? Yes. Commissioner Goble? Commissioner Goble, you're muted. Yes. 
Commissioner Anderson. Yes. Uh, minutes are approved. All right, next is the November 9th, 2020 regular meeting minutes. Could I get a motion in the second, please? I'll I move to approve. Go ahead. I'll move to approve. I'll second. Anybody with any comments, questions, edits, updates? That's the one that had the, up in the very, very top, it just I, like a J put in, I gotta pull it up. There's a, at the very top of the meeting minutes, you're right. There's a number seven before Will Met. We will take that out. Good catch. That's all I have. It's big. I had nothing. I had nothing. All right. Uh, then a roll call. Commissioner Abbott? Yes. Commissioner Murdoch? You muted my Sorry, name. yes. My apologies. Commissioner Schistler? Yes. Commissioner Clark? Yes. Commissioner Wolf? Yes. Commissioner Goble? Yes. Commissioner Anderson. Yes. Minutes are approved. All right. Sounds great. Um, next on the list is the communications and correspondence. I'm uh, checking the uh, the packet here. I didn't see any. Did, did I miss it or were well, there's none? There's none there in the more, packet. Isn't there one more set of meeting minutes? Yeah, I think there's one more set. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. That's November what I was trying to out. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I jumped right by it. November 16th, 2020 special board meeting. Could I have a motion and a second, please? My mistake. Move to approve. I'll second. All right. Any questions, comments, edits, clarifications? I had none. All right. Great. Roll call vote. Commissioner Abbott? Yes. Commissioner Murdoch? Yes. Commissioner Schisler? Yes. Commissioner Clark? Yes. Commissioner Wolf? Yes. Commissioner Goble? Yes. Commissioner Anderson? Yes. Minutes are approved. Okay, now let's try Roman numeral four communications and correspondence. Um, I'm not used to having none in the packet. None in the packets. We did receive uh, an email regarding Thornwood Park and uh, bathrooms, but it was after the packet. So, uh, but it, you all received it directly in your emails. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, we're going to hold off on public comment until after the Lakefront Comprehensive Plan. We've got the consultants from uh, from Lakota and Woodhouse Tanucci, and uh, anybody from Gowalt Hamilton or I do not believe so. No. Okay. All right. That's next up on the agenda then. Great, so I, I, I'm unsure who's, who's leading this tonight, but uh, you have the ability to share, so you can put the presentation up and the floor is yours, thank you. Yeah, well, I don't, uh, I'll, uh, uh, Scott, you're Brian, there. Yeah, why right? don't you take an introduction, Brian, we can go from where we were to where we are, this is Scott. Sure. Uh, there's, there's, there's no, uh, there's no <laughs> script here. We're, so we're going to see. But uh, I, I liked, I liked what I read, and uh, I'm looking forward to your presentation. But yeah, we are all just have seen it, and and I, you're going to go through it, and we'll comment on it. But it was good. Go ahead. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, appreciate the time, CB Scott Ferris with the Lakota Group. Uh, I have my. Um, Co-pilot in the pro in this process, uh, Andy Tanucci, uh, on the call uh, this evening or the Zoom this evening, as well as my whole team, uh, Deb Salmon, uh, Tom Martin, and Kevin Clark. Our other two team members, Gwalt Hamilton and um, uh, P Zone Associates, are not with us this, this evening, but they're input into the uh, state of the park uh, memo. Our, our summary report that you received uh, has been noted um, this evening. Um, Hey, Scott? It was interesting. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, uh, so let's talk about how this is going to go because you have yeah. some, you have various components to the 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 packet that you put that we've all been reading, correct? Yeah. And I would uh, so I'm going to suggest that uh, you get you you some you uh, go through each one of these packets and then pause for questions. We don't interrupt you until you reach the end of each of these uh, segments. Um, that, that, that's that, fine. That's fine. Uh, we've um, you have the full packet this evening. What we have is, a, I would call it a, um, a, a slimmed down version for presentation purposes yeah. uh, that highlights everything. Yeah. So I will give you a little overview of what we're all going to see and talk about. 
that's okay. consistent with what your packet is. But if we could wait till the end, that would be super helpful. Sure, I believe, and again, well, there's no script here. We haven't talked. So uh, are you primarily, will you be then uh, explaining sort of the uh, given conditions that, that you and your team have noted and then roll into uh, programmatic uh, requirements that you, uh, directions that you want to go in or, or you're suggesting that we may want to go in. Is there yeah. a kind of a two-part component here? No, that, that's exactly what it is. What, what it, uh, and and if, I can, if I can get into it a little bit here, what this is is an update in the process. Okay. An update that suggests well, what we've heard, what we've seen to date. Okay. Uh, from our finding standpoint, kind of the state of the district, We've compartmentalized that into a number of buckets uh, that you've seen, which is called park context, landscape conditions, utilities and infrastructure, Very circulation good. conditions, and special conditions. Uh -huh. Each of those buckets, we have some preliminary ideas and yeah. observations that okay. we can share with you and the board this evening to get concurrence on them before we move forward with what we would call the engagement, uh, more detailed engagement uh, part of this process. All right, you know, I'm just going to let you go then. Uh, if you feel like it's gone on long enough, then uh, maybe ask for a question, but you seem to be on top of this. So go ahead. I, 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 uh, we, we've got it. Um, I want to, I first of all, want to say to that point and to your, uh, to your discussion this evening, I think it's germane to, to, to point out that we're all operating in a different world uh, with COVID. Uh, and while we are developing, um, the title here is really update. The key is master plan update. It isn't reinvention of uh, numerous studies, uh, inventories, designs, and ideas that you've already been looking at over the last couple of years. Rather, we're taking those to the next level. Uh, we're challenging the thinking. We're compartmentalizing the topics. Uh, but all of this, I want to say, is in an air of uh, working within your means as a district, not going out there on a, on a limb. There's some longer term ideas and there's some shorter term ideas. The uh, gist of our conversation uh, with the board and with our Lakefront Steering Committee over the last month or so has been, let's develop actionable items that we can tackle uh, that are supportive of the community uh, uh, sentiment. And uh, we, can, we can still dream big, but let's focus on those first and move those forward. And then we can always keep those in the, in the back pocket. So that is, that's the premise we're operating off of right now. So this evening, as we jump and to your, me, And your presentation tonight is based off of your preliminary findings, plus a walk around in the park with commissioners. We have not yet engaged, gone through this formal engagement with the public that is still coming. If anybody sees anything tonight that, that alarms them, we are still, you know, the public is going to have their opportunity uh, Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Deb, if we can jump to the next slide real quick. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, just to give you a sense of that timeline uh, of the process, three stages of the process, analyze, engage, and envision. We are nearing the end of what we call our analyze stage. That is us looking deeply at the issues, the opportunities, and the site you'll see the outcome of that is a draft state of the, of the park report that you've received. It's draft, it's purposefully draft because we believe you can't complete that state of the park report until you get the voice of the next uh, phase of this project, which is engage. And as, as Commissioner Abbott pointed out, we need to talk to the community, we need to talk to specific focus, group, uh, focus groups and user groups and make sure that we're all collectively on the right page to finalize that state of the park report. Once that part, uh, report is complete uh, towards the end of, uh, uh, probably towards the end of uh, middle of February, because we want to ramp this process up a little bit faster. Uh, generally, we thought we would have had a lot more face-to-face -face engagement with the community. We know that we're going to be doing this all virtual, uh, at least for the time being. And uh, with that in mind, uh, we're making sure that we stay on an aggressive timeline to move towards uh, targeted completion of the end of March of 2021. In that last phase, once we've taken in all of the, what I would call the input from the community, tested the ideas, vetted them, uh, not only with you, but with other stakeholders, uh, we'll move into the envision part of the process. And the envision part of the process is compartmentalizing projects, initiatives, prioritizing them, and defining a specific actionable implementation timeline strategy and costs associated with each of those uh, particular areas. That's where you're gonna see the list of things to do, 
the dollars uh, in order to achieve them and the timeline that we established to try and get those done. And then associate that with opportunities for funding that are beyond your means, grants or other types of revenue streams. And I see a smile on somebody's face there. So it's important that we track the money through this process, but also I keep using that word and I use it with all of the municipalities today and that is working within our means. It's a changed world and we have to be respectful of where we're all at uh, with, with uh, community dollars. So uh, with that in mind, we can just jump to the next slide really quick. And I alluded to this. Tonight's discussion is, uh, is, is compartmentalized into five categories. They track the report that you received. We broke it down this way because it's easier for us as a group to get our arms around these specific areas of the park or issues in the park. They're broken down into park context, where we're providing the issues of the context of the park itself, its programming, its relationship to the neighbors and to its historical context. The second bucket is landscape conditions, kind of self-explanatory. It's really looking at deep dive of what is the landscape condition of this park? What are the vegetative communities? What are the problems with maintenance, management, sight lines, uh, 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 care, and long-term restoration of certain areas of the park that we need to get our arms around. The third category is utilities and infrastructure. Uh, clearly uh, addresses the issues of not only above ground, but below ground infrastructural needs uh, targeted uh, specifically to stormwater and targeted specifically to paved surfaces and restoration. That's a big topic you'll hear over and over. There's a lot of opportunities inherent in that little bucket. And then circulation conditions. And this really covers not only vehicular, but our bicycle pedestrian networks, our connectivity, and our, our directional uh, aspects of the park, our wayfinding and signage, our entry signs, the, the collective feel of moving yourself around when visitors come and the experience of coming upon uh, entrance points to this park. And lastly, the kind of a catch-all bucket uh, is special conditions. And special conditions really outlines unique elements and areas of the park, special areas where we should think a little bit differently. Maybe that's where we put our bucket of bigger ideas uh, or special ideas that we don't know how we can slot those into a timeline, but they're important nonetheless, and we should, uh, we should focus on those. So I'm gonna have, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm gonna have Deb walk us through the existing analysis of each of these buckets. At the end of the analysis of each of these buckets, there's a slide on what I would call our team's first blush at some observations, opportunities, and ideas. Uh, as Commissioner Abbott mentioned, uh, and we had some good discussion internally as a team and with uh, Executive Director Wilson, very important to know these are first blush ideas. They have not been vetted, tested, analyzed, evaluated, priced, or anything else. They're just ideas, and they're ideas we thought we'd test with you to see if they resonate, to see if they have a place in one of these buckets or not. Uh, and, and if they have a place in one of these buckets, are they of a higher, middle, or lower priority in your mind? We'll take all this information, we'll categorize it all, we'll readapt it, and this will be the basis for our engagement with the community. This will be the, the outline for how we engage focus groups, stakeholders. We will follow the same level of thinking, the same buckets, and the same line of questioning so that we're consistent and we can backfill the second half of this uh, engagement process to complete the state of uh, the park report. So with that, I'll let uh, Deb walk us through the uh, buckets. Thank you, Scott. First, we'll cover um, the park context. As Scott was saying, just the, the whole uh, kind of situation that the park sits within. Um, you can go ahead and advance it. Um, we have an, a park that really sits within a residential single family neighborhood, um, as well as uh, a lot of interesting um, institutional neighbors on the north. We've got the Wilmette Water Plant and the Michigan Shores Club. And then on the south, we have Wilmette Harbor, the Coast Guard and the Sheridan Shore Club. And so with within that so we've got those institutional neighbors as well as really being set within this single family neighborhood um all of the entrances are you could go back one tom all of the entrances are um coming from the east so we've got the main uh we've got a south entrance at sheridan 
um, and then a north entrance at um, Michigan and Lake Avenue, and then an exit right now at Michigan and Washington. Um, we also have some interesting ownership issues on the property with um, shared, shared uh, lease arrangements and MWRP property. And, you know, as moving forward, we will assess how those play into or not play into um, the, the master plan process. You could go on to the next slide, Tom. So just as an overarching analysis points that we wanted to elucidate, um, the park is really a unique combination of programming, park, and landscape uses within a relatively small area. The amount of uses that you have in such a small area is pretty uh, varied and really unusual. Um, entrance orientation is from the west. There's more of a public face along Sheridan Road and then you step back onto Michigan Avenue and Lake Avenue and you have a little bit more of a neighborhood feel. Um, there's a really strong residential and institutional neighborhood context and these neighbors are, present both constraints for space in some cases but also some opportunities. Um, we already talked about the ownership and leasing agreements that may affect long-term planning. Um, the one thing we really wanted to mention is the Beach House project, which really was the outgrowth of the former master planning process and launched kind of this first wave of a cohesive vision for the, project, for the park. And we're seeing this as kind of a starting framework for our planning effort that we're all doing together, as well as the future implementation efforts that will happen within the park. And then one last caveat is though we're not really exploring the Wallace Bowl and Lakeview Center um, in terms of programming, we will consider them as to how they relate to the larger park, park context in terms of connectivity and making them kind of a part of the cohesive whole of the park. And then um, quickly, as I mentioned, ideas came out of our analysis of each of these areas. And I'm gonna highlight some of these. We had, I think you all were provided with our list in a summary format in your packet this evening. I'm gonna highlight these and I'll tell you, there was a whole host of additional ones that we thinned out and, and, and cut out as part of this. We hope to, elicit conversation with you this evening that maybe shakes out some more additional ideas or clarifies these or summarizes these more succinctly. Um, out of the park context, the first one that jumped out at us uh, that resonated kind of clearly was the ability to really rethink a little bit uh, about selectively removing some of the vegetation in poor condition or adversely impacting the landscape character uh, of the park. and and, and not as a, a random, let's go just cut some trees down, put some ribbons around them, but more on developing a long range strategy for where those areas are, uh, uh, a game plan or a management plan or a stewardship plan of how we can selectively and carefully remove vegetation and then maybe put vegetation back in in other areas where there is value added to the park. It's kind of grown over the years and people have tended different areas and we'll talk a little bit more about that as part of the uh, as part of the landscape character. Also, one of the ideas that came out, and we thought this was kind of an interesting idea, is that the north end of the park clearly has a, a very different character, a very different park-like character. One that would be maybe called in a specific uh, description a garden-esque uh, type of environment or experience. And uh, while it's tended by uh, many different individuals who have focus on certain aspects of it. Uh, we thought it may be an interesting idea to frame that space uh, with some sort of low wall or perimeter to maybe create a, what I would call a, 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 some level of history to it that gave it a sense of enclosure, similar to the idea that the uh, stone gateway piers do, uh, create an entrance into the park at that midpoint uh, along Washington. Another idea that came out uh, with regards to the overall park and maybe more specific to this garden area of the park 
was the idea of gallery without walls. And the gallery without walls idea comes out of our experiences working in, um, in Oregon a number of years ago, uh, where a community that we worked in in Oregon actually invested in public art as a rotating component of their public open spaces, where they brought art into some of their parks and rotated it on a seasonal basis, created competitions, created an atmosphere of collegiality and introduction and awareness of art. But uh, the gardens there may lend themselves to that type of idea as part of maybe a community-wide art program, not necessarily supported purely by the park district. <clears throat> Excuse me, the, the fourth uh, idea uh, uh, Deb alluded to that is get a better understanding of ownership and leasing agreements uh, uh, with MWRD and how that affects our long-term programming. You saw that highlighted light color green or yellow area along Washington. Uh, there is a land lease agreement uh, in place with MWRD that doesn't have a lot of clarity or teeth to it. I think uh, part of our charge as we have uh, discussed with staff is to get in front of MWRD in the first part of the year and try and develop a working dialogue or relationship with them as an independent uh, voice uh, in the conversation. The next idea, consider ways of improving a sense of connection between the Sheridan Shore Club and, and the rest of the park. And that also speaks to the, to the Coast Guard. As we walked around the park, those, feel, those two facilities, as, as Deb alluded to, those two institutions, felt disjointed. They didn't really feel as though they were part of the park. They were just an aside behind a fence or a, another area. I think as we start to begin to re-envision our access, our circulation, improvements to pedestrian, bicycles, vehicular access, we may want to think about how those can feel as though they're part of the park a little bit better and maybe not on a, from a physical standpoint, but more of a, a metaphysical standpoint uh, uh, per se. The um, better integration of the sailing club beach and the overall vision of the plan. I think, um, you know, again, these are ideas. I think as we took our little tour, there were senses of angst built into uh, discussing and bringing into that conversation, the sailing club, but we have to be intellectually honest. It's a major component of the park and the beachfront, it draws a lot of use. It has a lot of opportunity. It's a special feature. You're blessed to have it. You have a very nice beach. You have a lot of sand. And I can tell you that your neighbors to the north would love to have as much sand as you do to operate a sailing and uh, a non-motorized boating beach to the extent you do. So there's value there that should be in this conversation. How we integrate that uh, in our future planning uh, is an important uh, factor. Um, the, to, the, uh, to exploring opportunities uh, to create a more distinct character between uh, the lakeside parkland and the parkside parkland to create a richer experience. That'll speak more to the idea of our road and our circulation improvements or ideas and how we can reconnect the lakefront, waterfront to the rest of the park. There's a lot of disjointed areas in this park that are bifurcated by roadways and parking. Uh, there are opportunities for us to look at um, uh, reimagining those spaces as part of an infrastructure, landscape, and parkland uh, context uh, discussion. And lastly, improving all entries into the park. I think um, as we walked, as we toured, as we got our arms around it, there's a very strong connection to the community along uh, the entrance to the south and Sheridan Road and the Baha'i Temple, a spectacular arrival sequence, uh, bridges, the yacht, uh, the harbor, the uh, Baha'i Temple, uh, but that falls off when you go to the north end of the, of the park and other areas of the park. And can we maybe bring up the quality and level and identity of each of these entrances to the, to the park in a much more cohesive and improved manner? Jump to the next one, Deb. Uh, Deb, um, Deb. <laughs> oh, you're muted. You're muted, Deb. All right, here there I am. Go. I'm back. Right. <laughs> um, I have a little whiny dog here. <laughs> um, next, we're going to jump into um, some of the landscape conditions. Um, we'll take a look at the exhibit on that. Um, we have a lot of different landscape types um, as part of the park, which is awesome. 
Um, we've got the traditional tree and lawn landscape, which kind of runs along Michigan Avenue, as well as kind of the center and southern area of the park, which has a lot of um, open meadow and trees, many of which are part of the Memorial Tree Program. And then we have some really distinct um, garden areas, um, the wildflower garden and the bird habitat garden along Michigan Avenue, um, as well as the 9-11 Memorial Garden, which is um, up by um, Gross Point. And we have uh, three different community groups or four different community groups that um, are involved in each one of those gardens, as well as the Park District staff. Um, um, in addition, um, we have in the parking lot um, the bioswale um, uh, habitat area, which really is um, kind of an outgrowth of the adjacent dune community that is um, at the swimming beach and further south where we have more of a remnant um, dune community that is still there. Um, as well, we have in the, the large open meadow, we have some seasonal uses for the ice rink. And I know there's a lot of um, infrastructure that comes into that space, especially on 4th of July. So there's a lot of, um, oh, I guess, flexible space in the park in those areas. Um, and then there are also some areas in the park that have highlighted plantings. Um, We've noted on here areas that already have them along um, the primary entrance at uh, Sheridan and Michigan, um, and then other areas, I guess at Lakeview Center too, and then some other areas um, that are highlighted in the pink that we feel could be additional um, accent planting areas if so desired. Um, and then also, we're, we, when we were out there all together, and as we have visited um, our, on our own walking tours, we've noticed that, especially along Michigan Avenue, there are different opportunities to open up views um, from uh, to Lake Michigan, and especially along the top of that bluff that runs along um, Michigan Avenue. And lastly, we have some not so pretty views going down those steps to, um, along the maintenance building slope that we could probably um, suggest some options for. Um, and then in addition, peppered around this um, graphic, you'll see the little um, leaf symbol, which is really showing particular areas um, I know Scott that mentioned that we want to um, have an overall kind of uh, approach to dealing with vegetation and stewardship and maintenance. These areas are areas of particular um, concern. So these are some of the more overarching analysis issues that came up, especially as part of um, the report that PISO did they went out and walked all along the landscape, looked at, at what plants are out there and gave a lot of the baseline information um, in the landscape analysis section of the report. Um, there are remnant dune communities along the lakefront um, that contain native species but are being compromised by foot traffic and, and once foot traffic, you know, it, more erosion sets in after that. In addition, we've got the, the regular, you know, lakefront erosion that is, is happening in our area. Um, the new beach house, dune landscape, and the parking lot bioswales also receive heavy foot traffic. And that leads to erosion, which will eventually make it difficult for the plantings to thrive. So it's something to keep in mind the parking lot bioswales are doing um, a great job of infiltration. There's a little issue on the south end that needs to be looked at. Um, 
there is an issue with stormwater um, depositing garbage. So that may be a, a maintenance issue to look into. The parking lot bed plantings are doing really well. Um, as I mentioned, there are a variety of special garden areas that are maintained by a variety of volunteer groups, which is awesome to have that in the park. Um, specifically, um, in the 9-11 Memorial Garden, there are invasive trees that are kind of making it difficult for some of the ground plane plantings going on there. It's becoming a pretty dense shade garden. And if some of the invasive trees were removed, um, that could be lightened up. Also, the stonework there um, is in need of some repair. Um, the wildflower garden and the bird habitat area are both made up of a mix of native and invasive species. And again, need a little bit of, of stewardship to keep them thriving. Um, especially the steep slope near the maintenance building. Um, th that slope is very steep and that in combination with, again, some invasive overstory trees has led to erosion and it, making it hard to develop the ground plane plantings. So if that overstory layer, um, if the invasives were removed and some other native species, um, more light got in there, it, it would be um, a healthier environment. Um, we already talked about the traditional tree and lawn landscape at the middle and south end of the park. And we learned through our walkthrough that many people highly revere this, this place. I think the trees hold high value for people. Um, but it's also a great programmatic, um, versatile programmatic space. Um, and then we touched on the Memorial Tree Program, which is really all over the park and has made great contributions to the diversity um, of the parkland. And I think there are ways that tree markers and maintenance could be more consistent um, to bring that together more cohesively. Oh, Scott, you're muted. From an idea standpoint, uh, under the landscape condition, there's a number of ideas, many of which were alluded to by Deb as, as she was talking through, but nonetheless, we wanna put them out there to see how they resonate with you. Uh, the first of which is developing this park-wide landscape strategy to connect the overall character and feel of, of the park. And inherent in our process will be some of that, uh, as part of our master planning strategies, not only a strategy but ideas uh, that come out of our that come out of our plan, uh, enhance or elaborate the special stone features. I think as we w walked through the park, uh, you could come upon three, four, maybe five different areas where little council rings or, or steps or elements of uh, perhaps Jensen esque uh, landscape. Uh, is found throughout the park. Those are really unique features that um, we should either look at restoring, recreating, or uh, blending into other areas of the park to create a, a common theme all the way through. Uh, we heard about reestablishing native plant communities along the shoreline, the dune communities, the dog beach, uh, and Gross Point. I think everybody's familiar with um, the, the character and feel of establishing a dune community, uh, and it kind of dissipates as you go to the south end of the of the beach or where the dog park and Gross Point are by virtue of use, uh, but maybe there's a, a way that we can integrate those more effectively uh, planning for the dog park or the dog beach itself. Uh, remove and manage invasive species, native habitat areas in certain north areas. Uh, we had a lot of discussion on that internally as a team um, uh, and it sparked a lot of discussion back to the whole concept of the storage building. Uh, it was a kind of a, a, a blended conversation one of a degraded uh, bluff or slope uh, highlighted by maple trees that have overtaken that whole area. Their root systems essentially allow nothing to grow in that area. And so it's become a little uh, bit uh, disconnected, disheveled, uh, dark, and disconnected 
uh, experience for the overall arrival sequence to the to the beach or the sailing beach. However, our 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 storage uh, facility is there, and so as we look at maybe clearing, uh, effectively clearing or selectively clearing some of that area to revegetate that bluff, it uh, it begs us to think about the storage facility and how that relates to that area. Is there something bigger and better with regards to some of our other ideas and themes inherent in this analysis? The idea of uh, formalized plantings in certain areas, uh, you know, this is, this is more of a conversation. We have a very native, naturalistic feel to the overall park, but there are certain instances throughout the park where a formalized landscape lends itself to an appropriate design idea or solution. Clearly, there is a native restoration um, goal inherent in other areas of the park and, and even in the new beach. Uh, house uh, uh, facility and parking area. So we want to be respectful and blend those, but there are opportunities for formalized plantings. Uh, use plantings to enhance spatial definition. And this is more about putting trees in the right places to frame some of our views, to frame some of our open areas, and to make sure we're aligning our green space and our programming spaces with the vegetation that surrounds that. For instance, if we want to, uh, move or change some of our fields or open them up for more uh, active recreation or more camp programs or other things we could do with regards to rethinking uh, tree placement. And that isn't taking trees away, that's more about how we add in new and when old ones are older or diseased and, and removed, do, do we just throw another one back in or do we think about it a little bit more strategically? Uh, documenting existing memorial trees, uh, as Deb alluded to, they're kind of all over and marked all over. And, uh, you know, they're an important part of a community, having those memorial trees. They should be there. Is there a better way by which we can manage them, identify where they are, log and, and categorize them? So if we want to have a bigger uh, connection to a, a, a park-like walk, as you'll see in one of our other ideas is this garden walk, a, a curated garden walk throughout the entire park. We're able to move people through a organized procession to certain features and components of the park that we want people to see or enjoy as part of an overall strategy. The, uh, I, I kind of jumped ahead a little bit. Um, one of the kind of, uh, I would call it uh, big bugaboos that has kind of long persisted, we understand it, it's, it's natural. Uh, is the blocked views uh, from Michigan Avenue and some of our neighbors immediately to the west through our garden-esque area of our park. Um, we've got to manage that. We've got to manage the expectations. We've got to manage the views and we've got to come up with a strategy that says, you know, there are going to be areas where it's blocked and there's going to be areas where it's open, but we need to take it as a whole and look how we can do that. Not on a site-by-site, -site, uh, window line by window line. That's not the way, right way to do this. We start with the park, we develop the strategy, we develop the idea, the concept of what we want that garden area to be, and then we work backwards to how we can identify opportunities for view sheds through to the, to the lakefront. Uh, it, the idea of <clears throat> respecting the existing lawn and tree areas and keeping that open uh, really resonates, particularly when we talk about our infrastructure and our, uh, our biking, walking, parking, uh, replacement of our asphalt areas. Now's the time to really rethink about how we can add more viable green space uh, back into this park while maintaining the facilities that we need to actively program and manage the park. That doesn't mean take away all the parking, all the streets, just because we like bikes and people. We do like bikes and people, and bikes and people should be the primary driver of why we have a park in the first place. However, we gotta be respectful of the fact that we need circulation patterns to provide cars, access, servicing, and emergency vehicles to get in there. And, and frankly, people still do, do drive to our park. And so in the bigger picture, how do we do that in a more balanced and respectful way? And lastly, uh, undertaking a comprehensive landscape assess, uh, assessment from a maintenance perspective. How do we take care of this park in an effective way? Are there sustainable, more resilient strategies to effectively managing this at a reasonable cost and level of effort uh, from staff and or outside vendors? Is there a better way to, to really look at this from a long-term perspective? And we'll dial into that uh, in some of our uh, broader thinking. So if we wanna jump to the next uh, bucket.
Sorry. Next, we're going to cover utilities and infrastructure. And again, here we, we did have um, our folks from Gaywalt Hamilton come out to the site and pull together some of the um, concepts we're going to be covering here. Um, the, the plan here is showing um, uh, some significant stormwater issues that we have around um, the north parking lot in the near the Wallace Bowl and up at our sorry down at the the south side um, where Middle Drive and Overlook Drive converge. Um, that was an stormwater issues. Um, in addition, we have throughout the park right now we have um, I'm sorry, I'm having a mental glitch. <laughs> the type of lighting that we have is um, uh, older sodium uh, dull lighting, um, but in the parking lot, the new parking lot um, that was installed with the Beach House project, um, we have upgraded LED lighting, both um, overhead and in bollards highlighting pathways. and that's something that we'd like to expand um, in, a, in a way of um, hierarchy throughout the park. So not that we want the same illumination level that is in the parking lot throughout the entire park, but just that we would kind of select, selectively illuminate with newer uh, bright lighting, uh, um, clear lighting um, throughout the park. Um, some of the other issues to look into are the, if you, the pink um, highlighted roadway on the map here is basically showing that a large portion of the roadway is currently in poor condition. It's asphalt um, bordered with uh, curbing. The curbings are for the, for the most part in good condition, but the asphalt roadway is in need of um, repair and in some cases replacement. Um, that's probably one of the biggest infrastructure issues that we have. Um, there are existing um, utilities kind of serving the Wallace Bowl and Lakeview Center areas as well as the beach house. Um, so it seems that th there's good utility service in those areas. Um, one of the other things that was noted was there are particular areas either due to um, surfacing or just the lay of the land where it, it's difficult to have ADA access. And some of those um, are noted on the plan here near the maintenance building. Obviously, that's a pretty steep staircase. Um, the wildflower garden may um, prohibit ADA access because of the size of the paths and um, the surfacing. So that could be a little bit more accessible. The sand volleyball court, the 9-11 memorial garden, and the, the big area leading to the dog park where we basically don't have um, a paved uh, surface. It's basically a sand pathway. Whether there, there may be a um, paved surface below there, but I, I know that um, the blowing sand is kind of a constant battle in that area. Um, go on to the next slide, Tom. So here's our analysis um, talking about that the asphalt roadways are in poor condition, but the curbs and sidewalks are mostly in good condition. Um, high pressure sodium lights is the word I was looking for. <laughs> that is basically the lighting that's throughout most of the park, except for in the upgraded areas of the beach house parking lot. Um, We've, we've talked about excessive part ponding and poor drainage in certain areas of the park. 
Um, we have a stormwater sewer network that runs mostly under and parallel to Middle Drive, Upper Drive, and Harbor Drive before discharging into um, the, the Dune Beach to the east, which is just south of the beach house. Um, we have utilities to the site, um, including sanitary power, gas, and water that connect to and service the Lakeview Center, the Coast Guard, and the Beach House. Um, and the two maintenance facilities have electric service. Um, there is consider considerable topographic relief that occurs across the site, which is constitutes about a 25 foot drop from the west to the east. So in some cases, um, dealing with that grade change makes it difficult um, to develop ADA accessible routes. Um, <coughs> we talked about some of the areas that currently are not ADA accessible, which could, could be um, made to be a little bit more ADA accessible if the priority was there. Um, so some of the stuff that we thought about, thinking about this analysis and really assessing the conditions with the utilities inf infrastructure um, is, uh, you know, as we looked at the asphalt generally all around the park, um, repairing and replacing asphalt roadways where they, where they are in good condition and, and a lot of that was in poor condition. Um, obviously, we want to think about that in the context of as we think about circulation and how um, if we end up removing roadways or changing that um, circulation, obviously we're not going to replace asphalt there. So it's prioritizing those areas that are really important um, and thinking about that from a capital standpoint so we can budget for it. Um, the second idea was really, and Deb brought this up, as you go out there at night and, and how striking the, the new LED fixtures, um, both at kind of the bollard level and kind of that what we would call the pedestrian um, scale level, really works well with the new lighting. And so um, just thinking about how we can implement that um, in other areas, sub areas of the park. And um, again, not lighting it to the level of a parking lot, but thinking about how we can do that um, just to have a clear, cleaner, dark sky compliant LED fixture. And that means lighting that is directed down toward the ground um, and is really clean and has a, has a, a brighter fixture. Um, three is, you know, addressing the poor drainage throughout the park, um, just with improved stormwater and best management practices, whether that's, you know, you guys did, there were bioswales implemented um, and at the, at the parking lot, many of which are functioning really well. Um, so it's thinking about those kind of ideas, but also fixing some of the issues with, with the ones that maybe aren't working right now, um, but also other areas like around the Walls Bowl that are having issues with drainage. We want to think about how to address those um, just using, you know, better best management practices and, and ideas. Um, the fourth, the fourth idea is to um, balance the impervious surface um, impact of any potential site alteration. So when we start showing ideas, um, thinking about, you know, whether it's pedestrian pathways, bike connections, um, changing circulation, um, removing roadways, we always want to kind of balance that out and think about where we're starting from, um, how much impervious service there is now, what's being added or taken away. So that'll be something that we keep a close eye on as we start to look at those. But it's always, uh, it's really important because we want to make sure that, our, at, that the footprint of the park doesn't change dramatically from adding surface, uh, impervious surface. Um, uh, Deb mentioned this in, in number five, um, developing an ADA accessible routes that connect to major features in the park. We want to make sure that the major features, the garden areas, those kind of tactile areas that are special, um, that people want to go to, um, are, are accessible. And, and so whether that's a surface thing or um, a grading thing, we want to just assess that and prioritize those areas so that people can enjoy it, people of all abilities in, in all ages, because we want this to be multi-generational, which it is, but we want to make it even in, uh, in more multi-generational park as we move into the future. Um, and then the last one is 
you know, developing a consolidated infra infrastructure improvement program. Um, and that just ties to the capital funding and, and special project phasing so that we are able to fund when we need maintenance repairs of infrastructure, whether it's um, utilities or um, hardscape surfacing. So just prioritizing that and thinking about the cost of, of doing those types of improvements. Am I doing circulation? I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Next, we're going to cover the circulation conditions. Deb, you want me to? You want me to jump in? Sure, I would love it, Andy. Okay. Um, happy to. So uh, just you know, just as you've seen, we've kind of walked through these the the plans just to talk about the the circulation conditions. And I think I think in general, the thing that we would all say about about Gilson and the circulation conditions at Gilson is that it's it's just not it's just not intuitive. Uh, it's one incredible park and asset uh, with a with a lot of different paths that um, don't all feel like they they belong together. So we have uh, connected paths, we have disconnected paths, we have we have redundant paths. We know upper drive and, and middle drive to be, to be redundant. Um, so, so as we think about this, we want to make uh, a more kind of connected and entire experience in the park and then understand uh, how, how circulation will, will play a role in that. So, so then we, we move from cars to, to bikes and pedestrians. And as you know, with the beach house, we talked a great deal about about pedestrians and bikes, at least on that side of the park. And we need to continue that conversation uh, across the entirety of the park. Um, we know that we still have issues uh, at the entry at Lake Avenue. Um, and how do we correct that? Do we improve that pedestrian step down? Uh, or do we truly make a move for a, a, a different kind of pedestrian access? Over on Harbor, we, we witnessed that there's really not a, a, a sidewalk there. So we, in, a, in, a, in kind of the same way, we have, a, have the similar problem over, over at Harbor Drive where there's a, a roadway, but there's really not a pleasant pedestrian or, or, or bike experience on that Southern side of the park. So um, just to keep things moving, why don't we just jump to the next slide? So here's just a summary of that, of that analysis. There's not a, there's not a comprehensive uh, pedestrian, bike, and vehicular circulation system that connects the entire park. That's that kind of counterintuitive. Where is the entry? Which is the right entry? Uh, if I've missed a turn, how long do I have to drive to get back in and around to the park? Uh, the pedestrian pathways aren't, aren't well connected. Uh, there's places where it works well, and there's places where it's, where it's broken. Uh, down towards the, the dog beach, that kind of accessibility and pedestrian path uh, dies down there to the southeast. Uh, there's important thoroughfares in need of pedestrian crossings. Obviously, safety is a huge concern. Uh, a large portion of the park, especially Harbor Drive, doesn't have that separate circulation system that I alluded to. Uh, we talked about the redundancies between Middle Drive and Overlook Drive. Uh, we have to talk about, about parking. We added 300 spaces. We, we maintained 300 spaces at the swimming beach. How many spaces do we need elsewhere uh, throughout the park? Obviously, the pedestrian approach at, at the swimming beach at Lake Avenue is still a consideration. Uh, and then the arrival and exit experiences um, uh, are, are a consideration. So jumping ahead. Okay, so these ideas again, let's create a, a comprehensive uh, circulation plan. Uh, let's consider the removal of Overlook Drive uh, and, and turning it into a pedestrian and bike, bike promenade. Uh, alternatively, let's explore the option of removing Middle Drive uh, to increase the amount of green space and, and increase clarity of circulation throughout the park. Improve the pedestrian experience, create that kind of connected, improved pedestrian experience. Um, extend pedestrian connections along the south shoreline to the dog beach, we mentioned that. Uh, provide a dedicated pedestrian boardwalk and bike pathway at Harbor Drive. Um, 
upgrade the pedestrian entry to the park and beach at Lake Avenue. Uh, consider parking pods. Uh, this is this would be, you know, again, thinking about the amount of parking spaces that we need in the park. Let's 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 create dedicated areas for parking instead of, you know, just washing it over the entire uh, park. Really, again, focus on uh, the clarity of that arrival and exit sequence. And again, in, in its entirety, make the pedestrian and vehicular experience just entirely more intuitive. I think wayfinding is also a consideration in this. Um, does somebody want to jump in with, with wayfinding? No, go ahead, Andy. I, I think that makes sense just to keep yeah, talking I think about this, it. Yeah. This flows right into it. So mm -hmm. um, obviously, the, not only do the, do the proper thoroughfares need to be there, it, it needs to be clearly marked. Uh, people, we need to help people understand how they should flow uh, in and to and through the park. And we do that by getting the right networks in place, but then also identifying those, those networks. So um, we talked about this on the walkthrough. There's a, a, a lineage of wayfinding in the park. There's very old wayfinding techniques. There's slightly old wayfinding techniques in the park and there's new wayfinding techniques in the park. And with, with, I think, with this master plan, what we should do is craft a, a strategy for over time uh, developing one connected uh, wayfinding strategy. Um, those those can include the historic columns that are there, those stone columns. Uh, that That's to say, does this new aesthetic take on some of those, or is there room for uh, a modern aesthetic that, that still uh, respects the older aesthetic in the park? You want to jump to the next slide? So uh, these conditions, here's just a picture of one of the newer signs uh, that was added with the, with the beach house. Uh, let's improve the entry sequences and, and uh, sequences in, in the hierarchy of spaces uh, through the park with wayfinding. Um, explore ways of uh, accenting those Washington Avenue historic columns along Michigan Avenue as a more prominent gateway. Um, I think there's considerations uh, about you know, let's, let's open up the uh, conversation about that being an entry into the park as well as an exit out of the park, potentially. And then, all, you know, ultimately expand that newly developed wayfinding signage uh, designed to create that more cohesive park-wide program. I'm going to go back to special conditions. Yeah, <laughs> I'll pick up on special conditions. Uh, this is a catch-all, as we had mentioned before, of, of all kinds of ideas that popped out on our on our walks, our tours, and collectively as a group, and they're highlighted by bubbles uh, to break it down into more manageable uh, pieces. Out of this comes the conversation of uh, shelters, uh, the idea that we need some additional shelters out there, and where are the best places for those to occur? Those are programmatic elements. Those are rental opportunities. They offer a whole host of different things that add value to the park and programming where can we see those happening throughout the park the conversation the big blue bubbles that are out there one big blue bubble exists up on the north east corner and that's the sailing beach and that conversation leads itself to is there something bigger and better there the the, the discussion focused on uh, can we take the existing facility improve the existing facility put the restrooms that we need in put a better office better boat storage inside maybe some additional storage for other facilities is there a revenue opportunity there from those who want to store their boats throughout the winter uh, in that space and can we make a an improved facility down there that adds value to the park probably a long-term lift but nonetheless something that we wanted to categorize was part of the conversation and part of the ideas that came out of it as we work our way uh, back towards the um, back towards the the north end, or the south end of the beach, a lot of discussion about the dune beach, the erosion that's occurred there. Can we improve those areas? Can we look at as we start moving along that entire south area other access points when it comes to uh, we get down towards the dog beach and down towards Gross Point? There was a big conversation that came up about uh, non-motorized uh, boat launch, uh, whether that is a uh, a canoe or paddleboard. Uh, is there some or, or a kayak towards the uh, towards Gross Point towards the harbor itself? Is there an opportunity there? What is the impact on the dog beach? What is the impact on the character access and circulation? We've got a lot of uh, I would call it uh, natural charm uh, down in that area that probably could uh, uh, 
uh, it needs some uh, consideration in this conversation, but nonetheless, we should be thinking about it. There's also the relationship issues that, that come out of this conversation, relationship with the Coast Guard and the um, Sheridan Shores Club, our Michigan Shores uh, friends, the, the Wilmette Water Plant. How do those facilities relate and is there a better uh, coordination or orientation uh, relationship that sh we should be thinking about as part of that conversation? As we jump over to the next slide, uh, Deb, um, just a summary of, of those issues. Uh, the idea of a boardwalk along the swimming beach to continue that conversation. Andy talked about that in circulation. Uh, is there some way where we can take the beach house and extend it all the way down on a beautiful promenade feel? Uh, you know, taking the road out of that area may allow us to create this beautiful experience for so many different people at so many different uh, demographics. And uh, the sailing beach facility is not having bathrooms. And can we make that a better upgraded facility really adding to the, the charm and quality of what was done at the, at, at the beach house? Uh, aquatics beach, poor visibility, underutilized, the dog beach, again, uh, needing a, uh, a little bit of a facelift down there. It's kind of a, it works, people love it, people go there, but it needs some improved access, circulation, maintenance, and control uh, variables built into it. Uh, the, the picnic pavilions, the idea of can we it really integrate those in more strategic locations throughout the park, a couple uh, areas that were identified on the, on the plan. Uh, the adjacencies to the different clubs and the different land uses that are surrounding us, making sure we're aware of those and how do we address those. The dune beach, uh, the, uh, the, the er erosion issues there of, of, of greatest concern. And if we're gonna maintain that dune beach, how do we manage that in a way that is effective and not impacted by other users, other programs that are occurring there, such as uh, 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 bathers, but also small craft launch ideas that have been put, uh, uh, posted around. Despite being a um, sailing beach, uh, there is a, a lot of uh, um, a lot of paddle uh, stand-up board locations along that area. Is there a better way to kind of integrate all of that from a visual perspective, access perspective, uh, and then storage perspective long term and making that a improved facility? And addressed in our in our um, in our uh, conditions idea are really the ideas that these are both long and short term initiatives. I think this is where we start to talk about the conversation of prioritization uh, and working within our means. Some of these things can be achieved in, in relatively simple order and some of them are longer term looks, leads, and discussions. Um, the idea of additional shelters and the revenue stream that could be uh, obtained from uh, programming and renting those spaces. The non-motorized um, watercraft storage at the, uh, at the uh, as part of the a new improved sailing facility and that revenue stream. Is that, a, is that a realistic opportunity? Is that something we even want to go down? The idea of the non-motorized launch uh, at the south end of the beach. There was some grimacing going on when we talked about that uh, in our walk and, and, and understandably so, that's a unique area down there. Do we want to impact with people dragging boats and kayaks and paddle boards through that area? And how does that relate to the, to the harbor? Is that an effective effective approach. And lastly, the Dog Beach, uh, a great facility. And um, we want to make sure that we enhance and improve that facility and bring the right types of amenities that would support it in terms of shelter, fencing, seating, uh, that whole arrival and walk up to it that's buried in sand. Is there a way we can uh, improve that so that it's more accessible for folks uh, getting into that area? And we talked about Sailing Beach. We talked about the maintenance facility and the Sailing Beach. They aren't mutually exclusive. They could be combined in the conversation, but we need to think about that because really, when you really look at that whole north end of the, of the, of the park and the beachfront, we've got poor access. We've got poor visibility. We've got a poor sense of arrival and character and quality that certainly doesn't meet the standard of the rest of the park or the improvements that have been made to the beach house. It is an area we should address. The question is the timing, the sequencing, and the impact, the cost of doing these types of things. How do we do that? again, in the effort to be uh, working within our means. So I think, we got, I think we got through all of our topics and our conditions and our um, thoughts. We'll, we'll circle back to those just briefly, kind of the next step, and we wanna make sure everybody understands the, the community engagement. And, and by community engagement, uh, this is where we really spend time with people listening to their concerns 
we probe the topics and the buckets that we talked about. Uh, we allow for additional ideas and, and thoughts, but we try to get people to hone in on some of the ideas that have already been brought up and characterized and um, find out the, uh, the sensitivities to those, but also the, uh, the like or dislike and how that we will inform us to moving forward on any of them, prioritizing them or taking them off the list. That conversation will go on in, in uh, middle to late January. Um, we will have a community open house. Now, how we have that community open house, it will be virtual by all uh, means. I don't think we're all gonna be uh, in line for the COVID vaccination and ready to go back to a normal lifestyle for a while yet. Uh, we are conducting community open houses in many of the communities that we're doing comprehensive plans, master plans throughout the country right now. They're working, uh, and actually, interestingly enough, we are driving attendance to them. People are looking, believe it or not, people are looking for things to do now as it gets cold out and there's not a lot of stuff going on and they've watched the TV program 16 times over. So I think if we do an effective campaign uh, for an open house, we will we'll have a good turnout. Uh, the targeted stakeholder and focus groups, that's on us to make sure we reach out to people off of our list. We de develop a nice list with Steve and his staff, and we will build off of that uh, as we go along. Um, I would say uh, to all of you, if there are certain people that we should be talking with that you feel are important uh, in this conversation, please let us know. We will make sure that we uh, make an effort to try and reach out to them and get with them in a virtual conversation. All of this will be summarized in February. We will take all of the findings, all the data, everything we've gotten from everybody, we'll merge that into the state of the, uh, state of the park report and bring that to conclusion at the end of February. Uh, along this timeline, between middle of February and the end of March, we'll be developing solutions, ideas, as I talked about, to some of these topics. Uh, that doesn't mean we're stagnant, waiting for uh, everybody to talk to us. That means we're gonna start doing that now, but we'll program that in and, and really kind of unfold it as we move into latter February and March. And that's because um, we're trying to accelerate this process on the tail end. With the uh, advent of COVID and the world shutting down, it's just limited our ability to do a lot of different things with the community, not our ability to look at the site and spend time there, but our ability to talk to people. So we kind of waited for the dark, cold months to get back inside with people. And I think if we jump to the next really quick there, Deb, I just real briefly want to tell you the types of folks that we're talking to. This will inform you if there's other people that we're missing. We categorize it into park goers, the community and neighbors. And so you can see there that there's a grouping of people of like members of the beach, uh, like members of the community that are focused on gardening and the Wilmette Foundation, Go Green Wilmette, really important stakeholders in the community that have an active role in making sure we do good things uh, at Gilson. And then uh, certainly our neighbors. And our neighbors may be more challenging. Some of them may be more, more challenging. Some may be very easy to get with. Uh, we know that we do need to sit with MWRD, uh, the village, uh, the Coast Guard folks, uh, Wilmette Harbor Association. There's a little bit, of, uh, little bit of difficulty maybe connecting with those, but we'll spend uh, effort to, uh, to make those happen. And then, uh, we thought that at this point we'd have maybe a little bit of a um, discussion with you on some of the thoughts that you've heard. Are there any kind of priorities that pop out? Uh, we always put this, are there any non-starters in the, in the bunch uh, that are just, uh, you know, boy, we need to do some more homework on that or we're just not ready to go down that path uh, yet. So uh, I open it up to uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, your uh, board. Any questions that you may have for us or additional thoughts? Um, thank you. Uh, Gordon, do you, is it, should I continue to um, lead this discussion? Yeah, please, please do. Just, okay. uh, you know, the one thing that sort of pops out to me is that we're still early in the process and there's a long way to go. So I hesitate to try and start parsing too much stuff quite yet yeah. before yep. the public had any input. So I just kind of would be reticent to start talking about non-starters or, or things, you know, even though I'm always one to try and get to the brass tacks right away. Um, you know, that's not how the process works. So I just, I would be careful with that. So my, um, so 
I certainly have uh, my comments here uh, come down to a few, basically the kind of follow your format here and preliminary thoughts. I basically have questions, which is not the time yet for me to say, well, I like this or I didn't like that. Just questions and observations. By the way, I thought it was really good. I mean, I thought this was excellent. You guys have really captured it. Whether or not I agree with every priority or every bullet point or not, you certainly have listened and captured the information. Um, then the, the big discussion here is the priorities of which I need to ask my fellow commissioners um, whether or not, uh, I, I counted uh, probably about 50 bullet points here as you went through. And these were the, uh, you know, the utilities, landscaping, circulation, special conditions. Each one of those, you had a list of bullet points, which is each one of those is worthy of discussion. I have an opinion, which kind of, this is the way I thought about it. Now I'm speaking to my fellow commissioners and you. Um, I thought of these as, as a, either a need, in which case is like, oh yeah, uh, master plan is not gonna be complete if you don't address that. Uh, a goal, which is like, well, I'm really sympathetic to that, but uh, you know, let's see what kind of idea, you know, let's see what kind of design, how might you address that? But that certainly sounds like a good goal. You know, it's like, I'm, tell, me, tell me more. And an idea. And there are a number of them, which is, I'm not always right. And I love it when you creative types, you know, come up with an idea because I haven't seen it yet, but it's an idea and I'm not going to say no. Uh, but let's, you know, let's, let's, um, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't hear much in the way of non-starters, but I heard some I ideas. It's like, well, okay. So how do we, as this board, um, that we want to try to, in this, in, the, in this meeting, try to tackle probably those, each of us has seven board members, maybe 50 bullet point ideas. So that, that's a long night. Uh, <laughs> so how, do we, how do we want to do that? And that's question, Gordon, maybe you want to start this. Do we want to try to get into every one of those points tonight? I'm okay. Absolutely, absolutely not. I, I think... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I, as I said earlier, I, I think at this, we're still, if you okay. think about the process, and I'll let, you know, Scott kind okay. of elaborate on it. I don't okay. think we're here yet to start giving opinions on stuff unless there's something they missed. Yeah. You know, we, and we think it should be thrown into the mix, but we've got a whole groups of people who have yet to weigh in at all, sure. who you know, will give their thinking and their feedback and that's going to add to the mix. And, and, you know, I think we have to trust the process that things will start to filter themselves out along the way. And then at later point, then we can get in there with once things have been sort of baked a little bit longer and, and start giving, you know, kind of our priorities. And, you know, at some point, it, instead of, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we've got Gilson's hierarchy of needs. And I think you were <laughs> sort of getting at that with what you were saying earlier. I mean, there's some things that just got to be done. And then there's other things that are maybe not necessities in the in the pure sense, but are going to add a lot of value and, and should be done. And then other stuff that, you know, may be further out and may never get done or might get done a few years down the road. We don't know, but it's, I think it's too early to start making those calls. Um. Yeah, we do have our consultants here, and we've got seven board members. Uh, I, you know, I don't want to be here till midnight, but uh, I don't want to completely. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe other board members want to. I certainly have questions. I want to get to those. Um, so I have a suggestion, and perhaps we could have you know initial reactions to the presentation as a whole. You know, did mm -hmm. it reflect what we understood? Um, are there any areas we'd like you to? you know, consider adding and or expanding. Um, okay. I, I would agree that it's probably premature to exclude anything um, because I do want to see the community input uh, and, and, and go further. So um, if I may, I'll kick off and then we can, you know, um, go around and, and you know, perhaps that'll help right. us at the stage. Um, you know, so first of all, thank you, um, Scott, Andy, Deb, uh, Tom, Kevin, great work, and to the entire team. Um, I feel that this certainly captured the spirit of the um, walking meeting that we had, and we had, um, you know, I, I, at least two hours together, and then I, I, I'm sure you've visited several other times in addition to round out some of your recommendations. Um, to me, this 
captures the spirit of that meeting as well as the additional direction you've received from uh, Steve and his extended team. Um, it, I would make one addition and, and then another suggestion about the community improvements. Um, we in this community and, and among this board have had a lot of discussions recently about restrooms. And, um, you know, I would encourage us to think through, you know, the, we have the restrooms in the central part of the park with the, the beach house. Um, if we explore restrooms, you know, toward the sailing beach, the north end, I think it might be worth exploring uh, restrooms at the, you know, at the south end. Uh, particularly where we have the playground, we have some tennis courts, we have um, the, uh, you know, recreation area that, for fitness. Um, so I would be interested to uh, at least explore that or test that with our community members. Um, I, I also would note um, when you're re recruiting for community engagement, you know, one of my professional areas of background is marketing research. And I think that the cohorts you've identified look good and are, are ones that I think are important to source. I would also encourage you to think about a strata of um, longtime residents, perhaps mid mid-range residents and newer residents. Um, although we've lived here now um, you know, many years, what I've noticed is that when people move to Wilmette, they're typically young families and they may be making their, um, the largest investment of their lives as they purchase a home. Um, a really common migration path, as I think everyone knows, is you leave the, the city with one and a half children leaving a condo. And so you have, um, you know, you're, you're buying a home and this is a really attractive community for that reason. So um, with some of that, there is often an expectation of certain amenities. And so I would just think through um, among any of these, you know, constituents that you're considering is that we look at a strata of either, um, either demographic or, you know, duration of residency just to get a variety of perspectives. I think that's an excellent question. Generally, those younger families are happy to spend money on lots of things and the older demographic is I'm done. <laughs> and so I think that's a, that's a really, really good point. How would you see us in defining that stratum of, of uh, age cohorts? Is that something that we should uh, target a specific people or is it just because we will have that we hope in a community mm -hmm. workshop I, and we will have it by default in the other group categories, but do you mm -hmm. want us to specifically say, hey, I want you to target um, young families and you know, find moms one morning after a school or through the school system where you can sit, you know, talk with and them dads. on a Zoom. Yeah, yeah and dads, yeah. right, exactly. Yeah, I mean, it is nice to get a sense of, um, you know, filling, you know, recruiting to, to fill a, a, a persona, if you will. We work a lot on personas in marketing, about personas of users. Um, so you might have um, families with children under 10, families with, you know, children 10 to, to 25, and, um, you know, older children, um, or even into college age. And then the active individual is a persona I think about. Um, I could I could talk about this at some length, so um, I'll, I'll leave it there. Great. Thank um, you. I think the passive recreation is really, really important. Um, I happen to be a frequent visitor to the dog beach and I see lots of passive use, which is really wonderful. So I wanna be sure we recruit for, um, you know, perhaps walkers or caregivers bringing, you know, um, our, old, our older residents. So those are four areas I might think about. Great, thank you. And that, those are my comments for now. Thank you. Uh, I had a couple of questions and um, more questions than comments. Um, uh, one of the things that you discussed was the invasive species of trees and, and um, uh, this type of thing. Um, I would love to somehow be able to identify those or figure out maybe a plan with those because that actually seems kind of problematic no matter what we do with the master plan. Um, so I would love to maybe uh, see where those are or identify both location and just types of species, what might need to be done to address those, how pervasive that is in our park, and just to see you know, more of an outline of what that problem looks like. I, I think as we get into our specific strategies and actions, you will see all that. You will see that. Good. 
too. Good. Anything else, Todd? Yep. Um, anybody else? Well, I know other people have comments. I, I can hear you out there. Come on. I'm happy to chime in. Um, I guess I have two primary comments. Um, one, um, I'd just like to renew my objection that I think it's um, not logical to me that we are doing a master plan for Gilson Park and excluding the Wallace Bowl and the Lakeview Center. Um, so I, as I've said before, I still think that should be part of the process. But moving past that, um, I, um, I just wanted to um, restate Andy's uh, excellent comment, probably the, the most interesting comment tonight, is that the circulation is not intuitive. And I would certainly agree with that. And uh, I certainly hope that we will take a, a fresh look at the, at the circulation and not be bound by the current circulation, especially as, as it was pointed out in the presentation that uh, much of the, the road infrastructure is in such poor condition that probably, at least from we heard from earlier presentations, that some of it's not salvageable and so there, there might not be much of a cost difference. And, uh, and just in general, I'd emphasize that I'd certainly like to see overall less pavement and, uh, um, and less motorized vehicle traffic. And those are my brief comments at this point. Okay. I would actually like to echo his comments as well on that. Um, I think that we should consider the Wallace Bowl and, and at least how uh, and, and Lakeview Center as far as you know, how that will affect the park because I think that really helps to determine or could determine what else we might want or how we might want to use it. I will, um, I'll just offer in, in response to that. With regard to the Lakeview Center, I do believe that Lakota is um, considering the Lakeview Center as it fits in with the uh, park itself. With regard to the inside of Lakeview Center, we are in the beginning stages of a, of, of a renovation design. We haven't seen it, the Lakeview committee hasn't seen anything, but there is, that, that is moving a separate path, uh, the renovation of the inside. But I, I do think, at least with regard to the Lakeview Center, Lakota is considering the pavement and how the outside of that building fits in with the, the park scheme. Am I, Scott, is that accurate paraphrasing? That's right. We're not, we're not addressing the physical use or the internal operations of it. Now, with regard to the Wallace Bowl, I think also in general, I think that Wallace Bowl's functionality is sort of a given for Lakota, but how it fits in with the larger park um, is sort of subject to their uh, consideration. Again, does that sound accurate, Scott? Yep. Okay, so, but this board certainly can say we would like to take a deeper dive into uh, either one of those um, if we wish, you know, we, we, we're allowed, we're an organization, we can change our minds. Uh, so, I, you know, we'll, as we go around the table here, we'll hear from people and maybe they can weigh in on their, uh, their ideas. Um, so uh, I just want to understand maybe a little further from Scott or, um, or Andy or Deb, you know, so what's in for Lakeview and Wallace? Sounds like the pathways perhaps in the way that you navigate around the park and interact with them but not necessarily the renovation of them ex specifically. Ex exactly right it, it would be oh, about okay. it'd be about circulation access the landscape character around it signage to it impacts of parking and serviceability if we remove paving and all those types of things but we're not addressing the physical facility itself meaning the building is going to stay there as far as we know and be fixed. And the mm -hmm. Wallace Bowl is going to stay there. And at some point, you'll need to renovate or fix or replace wood or whatever it is, but it's not changing use. If you said to us, we'd love to see it reinvigorated, reinvestigated as something else, or to move it or recapture that space for something else or put a dome over it, that would be outside of the scope of what you asked us to initially do. I haven't heard about a dome, but that sounds interesting. <laughs> you don't want well, to know. <laughs> but Scott I would like, just... maybe Mike, just to maybe elaborate a little on your area yeah, of I, it interest. Really doesn't, it really doesn't need, it does not need reinvigoration. It, it is a very active, actively used uh, yeah. piece of our, piece of Gilson Park. Um, 
But I mean, I suppose since I've said, let me just, I guess I'll jump in too and echo with Mike the um, circulation issues, I think um, are, are of priority of, in, in dealing with this. Just, just the, the infrastructure and the, and as, it, as Andy's pointed that it's not a very intuitive um, uh, traffic flow through the park. So that's, that's my comment on it. Great. If I could just jump back in on that, I know um, Julia had asked. So Scott, you had mentioned, for example, parking needs. Well, obviously the parking needs will depend on the use of those two facilities to some extent. So it's difficult to do planning if it's possible that um, we may use those in different ways in the future. And I personally believe that both the Lakeview Center and the Wallace Bowl have significant untapped potential um, that I would have preferred to explore more deeply. That was, that was my point. Well, okay. Let me ask you that. So, I mean, is that like different stage, different bowl, different, I mean, uh, better uh, AV, uh, you know, speakers and, and, and uh, theater uh, infrastructure, that kind of stuff you'd like? Sure. To uh, good, good questions. And, and I don't want to take this too far off on a tangent because this is something the board has discussed mm -hmm. before. So, but uh, so, for example, with the, the Lakeview Center. I personally feel that the current configuration doesn't maximize the use as a special event space, both mm -hmm. in terms of the layout on the, the main floor upstairs. I also think with that uh, elevated deck with that view of the, the lake, that the deck structure should be dramatically bigger, including covering the service area and extending out toward the east. If that were to happen, the, that space could be used for a variety of, of activities and events that it's not currently used for. And again, there might be some parking impact. In the same view, in the same way with the, the Wallace Bowl, um, I personally would like to see more music venues down there. I think there have been times where we have a handful of them, but the way that we currently schedule the Wallace Bowl, we lose a lot of that opportunity. And again, I think it's, I think it's a gem. I think it could be a much more utilized community resource uh, if we took a look at how we program in that space and we take a look at the infrastructure to see what types of events we could accommodate because a lot of our infrastructure in the Wallace Bowl is old. So yes, those are things that I think should be explored as, as a part of the master plan. And I think I've mentioned that in the past. So I just wanted to point that out as we were talking about it. I think we can yeah. explore those. I don't know that I need to explore them in the master plan. Let me take them individually. Uh, with regard to the Lakeview Center, you've mentioned something here that kind of ruins my argument. But as long as we were staying within the walls, I was good with having a, you know, a separate discussion about what the Lakeview Center could be. Um, I wasn't, I don't, I don't know that I could get, we, we, over the last eight years I've been on the board, there was talk about expanding it, making the Lakeview Center bigger. There was no economic argument for doing that. It was sort of a, well, that sounds pretty good. Maybe we can make something out of this, uh, this sow's ear. Um, and I've never got all that excited about it. Um, but in terms of uh, renovating the Lakeview Center to bring it into the 21st century, because it's, it's tired and its layout isn't good, inside I'm good with, I'm good with uh, it, let's do a project on the inside and let's figure out how to make more out of that. Your discussion of a perhaps looking at the deck on the outside kind of touches into what what the Lakota group and Andy are doing here. Yeah, I don't know how to draw a line through that. So. And by the way, I want to agree with you. I, I know that when I was on the board last time, we were talking about, you know, elevator and other expansions. And, and I don't see the economic argument there either. Right. Decking is far less expensive than new building. And again, making the, the space, especially that, especially that second floor space more efficient could have a dramatic impact on the number and types of uses and the amount of folks visiting that, that facility. Those were my points. Yeah, the Lakeview Center is, it's an asset. It's not a building or a facility that is easy for us to somehow or another leverage into a, into a more, pro, let's just say profitable uh, asset. It certainly provides a function. Um, it's never gonna pay for itself, nor would any expansion of that building necessarily pay for itself. Although I'll grant you that, that you, your idea of expanding that deck, you know, that's not expensive. I am, uh, uh, you know, outside of a, a, a large movement with the board to include the Lakefront Center, Lakeview Center, 
uh, into this master plan, I'm staying where we are unless I hear, uh, you know, a movement among the other con commissioners. With regard to the Wallace Bowl, look, I don't mind. I don't, I did, we didn't hire uh, Lakota to do this. I don't mind talking about these things. Um, I don't know if it's in their, in their wheelhouse or not. Well, I don't know. These guys, you guys will do anything, right? I mean, you guys love talking about this. <laughs> Uh, Here, li listen, I, in our, our wheelhouse, our wheelhouse can accommodate any of these discussions between our team and Andy and our rest of our team. We can, we can, we can uncover uh, and evaluate anything that we were, we were charged at the beginning with being cautious about certain things to make sure that we had a smooth sailing, positive, updated plan. Uh, and we want to make sure we're doing that. But if the board feels like we should not be excluding these, uh, maybe there is a, a right fit a, approach to how we address these that meets your expectations. Okay, well, we don't have, uh, we don't have unlimited time here. So I'm just gonna say, I hear you, Mike. Uh, talk to your board members, uh, commissioners. I'm okay with the scope of the master plan as is. And okay. others jump in and help you out there. They Thanks, should. Brian. All right, so. I, we'll, but we'll even, even, even with Mike's, um, idea with, um, for example, and I'm just trying to figure out how to navigate this, uh, of wanting to have more music and uh, to utilize the Wallace Bowl more. Perhaps we need to figure out uh, maybe better sound proofing or to where it's not disturbing the neighbors. And maybe you know, that hey, folds Todd, into the- Todd, I'm sorry, to, I, I'm gonna have to yeah. interrupt. At this point, it's 9.15 and we're halfway through the agenda and that we're going off on a tangent and doing, you know, something. Just a little history on this. At the, at the time we were concerned about focusing our consultants on what was the most important for Gilson Park and trying to keep the cost. Uh, and, and again, making a leap that the costs are gonna be high. We're not gonna do all 50 items on the list. And it was sort of to get them focused on what we felt as a board at the time were the most important things that needed to get dealt with and keep them from going down rabbit holes. Um, I think the conversations about Lakeview Center and the, the bowl are, are great conversations to have, just not at this point in time. And so let's, let's move on from it if we don't mind. I'm good. Can I I would avoid the term rabbit hole, but sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Amy, I haven't heard yeah. from you. Yes, I'd love to have my comments. Um, I was going to kind of reiterate that same kind of thing that I'd really like to see us prioritize the critical infrastructure needs, which is kind of where these this project came from. We really have to focus on the roads and the sewers. Um, I know it's not always the prettiest <coughs> or the things that get people excited, but they're in such disrepair that we have to, and they're large ticket items. So I do think we have to put a bulk of our, our um, common sense and our, our timing there. So um, I agree with uh, what Andy was saying in regards to circulation. If we are removing some roads because they're just completely torn up, maybe we kind of re-envision where the roads should go. I think we mm -hmm. also need to be focusing on pedestrian and bike pathways. Mm -hmm. That's a huge yes. need and ask that we've had. We did do a survey and I feel like it's been years and years ago now from the community, but they were pretty clear about asking for pedestrian walkways and bike pathways mm -hmm. through the park. So I would like to focus on that. Um, finally, I think I'd like to say that one of the other things that came out of that survey and one of the other things we've continued to hear from residents is a need for a landscaping plan. And I love the idea of being able to remove unwanted trees and plants that are uh, invasive to the area and putting in things that we know will grow and also support the uh, ecological nature of birds and um, other creatures that are in our park. So I, I think that we need to be conscientious of those things. and really looking, uh, focusing back to where our priorities are, where, where this project started. So I agree. Thank Thanks. You. Uh, I appreciate you bringing up the survey uh, because I think it is worth returning to again and again and again. Um, when it comes to the priorities, I think uh, the community gave us those and we keep coming back to the big issues. We do like to talk about the tangential issues, but it's roads, it's sewers, uh, it's circulation, um, it's those, uh, it's those things that uh, the community had told us as landscaping plan, as you say. 
uh, again and again, we've heard uh, that those are the priorities. So I appreciate you kind of bringing us back to that. Um, I'm gonna, I've got a few questions and then uh, we'll talk, we'll, we'll just talk briefly about uh, one, one thing, uh, um, Scott, and um, please, would you change it to Sheridan Shores Yacht Club? Uh, I know it doesn't seem like much, but put the word yacht in it, that's their name. Um, it's so change all your make sure it's it's the yacht club um i know it doesn't sound like much but i want to make sure we get their name right got it. um i wouldn't mind talking about a little bit more you mentioned in there about winter activities particularly about the ice skating rink um this was something that never got very far with the uh, referendum plan um it would be something I'd, I, I want to kind of keep an eye on, but I don't want to go overboard on that. I don't want to spend much money on it, but you know, how does Gilson Park relate to winter activities? Um, parking at the Lakeview Center, you guys need to under, understand that uh, we did not put an elevator in at Lakeview Center. And so the upper parking, we have lower parking that's met, that um, handicap, you didn't actually identify in your plan. I know you know it's there that handicap parking up top is not only important, but right now it's kind of not good. So uh, make sure um, you, you take a good look at the Lakeview handicap parking on the upper level. There is a sanitary sewer survey. It was done back around 2013, 14. Bill Lambert did it. About a third of our sewers were caved in at that time. It does exist. If, if, the, if the staff can't find it, I can see if I can find a copy of it. Um, but there was a sanitary sewer survey identifying the areas of cave-ins. They're like 10 inch clay pipes. I, I don't know if you can repair a hundred year old 10 inch clay fired pipes or whether or not they need to be dug up. There was a survey. Um, MWRD stormwater, you kind of like, uh, I, I took a deep in, uh, breath when I heard about uh, that maybe the need for um, stormwater storage I don't want to build tanks. Um, if we, I, I would like to avoid such a thing. You would only be up top, right? You don't need it like in the boot. But I don't want to get into a big discussion about that. Um, yeah, I just kind of that caught my eye. It's like, ooh, we we might need stormwater permits, uh, or we might need stormwater storage. And I'm hoping to avoid that. I have lots of comments on all those points that you raised up. Um, again, some of them were terrific and must do needs any master plan. I, how, how should Gordon and other members of the board, how should commissioners make their thoughts known about their priorities with this, with what Scott and his group has pre pre presented? How would you like to go about doing that? Rid My suggestion would be for them to funnel them through you as the chair. Okay, very good. Then, then the goal would be on our next meeting, the Lakefront Committee, unless you disagree, that I'm hoping to receive um, any uh, written or even if you're on call, um, your comments on this presentation. I thought the presentation was terrific. I was like, you guys have been paying attention. So, um, so yes, that would be good. Because then the Lakefront Committee basically is going to help funnel these priorities back to the back to the the design team. It sounds good to me, unless anyone has any objections to that. Then I think we're done with. Then I'm then I am wrapping up my. These are my comments, and I'm done with this discussion. I thought it was terrific. I really appreciate the design team, and uh, yeah. uh, and to the community at large, we are getting to you. As you, if you saw the timeline. In uh, January, February, we will begin our uh, they, designers will begin the open outreach and engagement with the community. So this is a good plan. If anybody's listening, read it. It's good. Uh, it doesn't mean we all love every idea in it, but it's a good start. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I would uh, repeat that. I think there this report was really, really good, and all four firms have done a, a great job on it so far. Okay, uh, ready to move on to item number six, the public comments and recognition of visitors. Steve, can you do your thing, please? Sure. Um, this is where I go around the screen and call on any names who are not 
staff, board members, or consultants, uh, if you would unmute yourself, give us your comments. You have a three minute window of time to speak. If you have nothing you wish to say, you can merely acknowledge that you've been called on and that you are strictly observing this evening. So moving around the screens slowly to make sure I don't miss anyone. The first uh, public uh, name I see, Walter Keats. Walter may have left us. Uh, moving on, uh, I see Isaac Gates. Yeah, I'll be really quick. Uh, first, I just want to say thank you to everybody. Um, I, I want to echo what, what Brian was just saying, that I thought it was a, a great presentation. And I also appreciate uh, the board members um, taking your time um, to be here. And I, I'm just, uh, you probably recognize me as I sent an email about um, my proposal to add uh, disc golf uh, to Gilson Park. Uh, I just want to mention that to the, um, since we ha happen to have the people here uh, from all the consultants, um, I'm suggesting that, that we may want to consider putting a disc golf course. And I think uh, based on the presentation, one thing I noted was that it, the area I'm suggesting is the sort of that area that you're calling the MWRD spot there um, between uh, Michigan and upper drive. Uh, and so it actually may be a good fit that it's a, probably a very low impact uh, sort of investment that uh, probably you could get through. Uh, obviously, if you put a building in their property, that'd be an issue. So uh, that's all I'll say. So again, just thank you very much. Um, yes, uh, that'll be, uh, uh, I'm just gonna I'm jump on here. So Isaac did make a presentation to the late front committee uh, about this. And it was a really good uh, proposal. We don't usually get from the public such a thoughtful and uh, well uh, laid out proposal. Uh, I, I think it's generated some discussion amongst the, the commissioners. Uh, uh, certainly Mr. Goetz is gonna, uh, will continue to champion this and perhaps maybe even ask master planners to take a look at it as well. Uh, so thank you for your comments. Great, thank you. Uh, next on the screen, I see Andrew Levy. Yeah, Andrew Levy, 1025 Seneca Road. Um, I would just uh, suggest to the board that as you think about uh, how pedestrians and bikes move through and around the park to really look to synthesize that approach with the active transportation plan uh, that the village is working through uh, and look at some of the principles and vision uh, that the village uh, is adopting with respect to that in order to really create a, uh, an integrated model uh, for users uh, throughout WOMAD. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next on the screen, I see Allie Frazier. Hi, everyone. No public comment, just an introduction as a candidate for commissioner. And thank you for having me on. Thank you. Next on the screen, I see Charlie Hargrave. I have no comments with regards to Gilson. If this uh, session right now is limited to that scope, then I have nothing else. No, this oh. is a public comment in general for the Board of Park Commissioners. So any and all topics related to the Park District are fair game. I was very impressed with tonight's presentation with regards to uh, moving forward with uh, the development of Gilson. And I hope that the board goes to school on what they've seen uh, especially with regards to community involvement and involving neighbors of your parks. Uh, I live at 2540 Laurel Lane, which is on the south edge of the community play field. And uh, unfortunately, there's been a good deal of work done uh, already before any of the neighbors had a chance to weigh in. Uh, specifically having to do with the irrigation project that is going in. And uh, so the village, uh, with regards to the stormwater collection tank, had done an exemplary job in keeping us informed. And when the project, uh, when that part of the project was completed and the rest taken over, uh, sanctioned by the intergovernmental agreement, uh, which seemed to be park district, school board, and village, uh, all agreeing to do things without any input from your neighbors. 
And so uh, the village had indicated that the park would look the same after the project than it, uh, as it did before the project began. And looking out my window, I see several eyesores that are of a permanent nature specifically the pumping station for the irrigation. Uh, two things about that. First, uh, I can understand why it needs to be centrally located with regards to the rest of the irrigation, but it was placed within like one foot of the existing concrete path uh, down the center. And if it had been simply moved four or five feet further north, then there would be ample space to put a hedgerow in front of it or all around it. But now you can't do that on all sides because you'd have to tear up the path. And then second, simply to make it blend in a little bit, instead of having it desert brown, couldn't you have gotten green panels so it blends in a little bit? Thank you, that's all I have tonight. Thank you. Um, next on the screen, I see Gary Knight. Hi, I'm just listening. Thanks. Thank you. Next on the screen, I see Patrick Duffy. Hello, I'm observing, but also have submitted my name as a uh, candidate for board member. And just wanted to make a comment that uh, <laughs> while I was reading through the agenda for tonight, and I saw that Lakota group was presenting, um, I got a snack ready because I knew it would be a great presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, next on the screen, and now we're, we're doing the ever dangerous paging between screens, um, Kent News Cable. All right, I don't believe Kent. Oh, there he goes. He unmuted. Kent? Thank you, Steve. Uh, yes, Kent News Cable 2530 Laurel Lane. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to thank the board for giving us an opportunity to speak. I enjoy the uh, presentation on Gilson. I think it was very comprehensive. Um, a relative to, I guess, the IGA and the stormwater uh, uh, project that the village has moved forward with, I guess I'd like to see a similar approach to the three parks involved with that IGA to kind of give the residents a big, a big picture of what can happen at these parks and just kind of put a hold on further uh, movement forward with developing those three parks. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. And then we will circle back to Walter Keats who didn't respond the first time. All right, uh, then I believe it's back to you, Commissioner Anderson. That sounds great. The next item is the approval of the voucher list. And I don't know if the commissioners noticed there, there was no voucher list in the packet. So we're going to have to schedule a special meeting probably, I'm going to guess, for early next week, just given the notice and requirement. But uh, Steve, I'll let you, you and Libby figure out the right time for that. Um, to do and that. Then from, bills before the end of the year, right? Well, that's we'll, what I thought we'll, too. We'll schedule a time and get it approved uh, timely. It, we, we unfortunately uh, didn't include it in the packet. I'd like to say we were strictly testing all of you, but it was just a miss as we were combining the various pieces of the packet. So we will get a meeting scheduled shortly, get a packet posted uh, and conform to all the Open Meeting Act requirements. All right. And then we move on to the executive director's report. So back to you again, Steve. Great. Um, I've got a really long report for you guys tonight. I, I thought this would be a good time to go in depth about things. Um, so election filing began today. Uh, in my report, you have uh, information about the filing hours. You also have information about a um, lottery for those that filed simultaneously. Of our eight filers today, we had seven simultaneous filers, and therefore there would be a lottery. But at the time I wrote that memo, I was unaware that you need to give seven day written notice before you execute that lottery. So all the candidates have been notified that the lottery will not be taking place tomorrow via email uh, and they have the new information. Um, the other information is that the lottery will take place at 9 a.m. on Tuesday, December 22nd 
uh, all the uh, information in my report regarding the Zoom link and the passcode and the meeting code remains the same, but it will be on a different date. Oh, by the way, seeing consultants on the screen still, feel free to click out and have the rest of your night to yourself. We appreciate your time today. I should have said that at the beginning, I'm sorry. Um, and then the rest of my, uh, most of my agenda was, uh, or report was on type topics we've already covered. Uh, tonight with the presentation and the tax levy hearing. Uh, as a result of the tax levy hearing and of the need of having to approve uh, the ordinance and then the associated reduction resolution uh, in December and filed with the county before the end of the year, you will have that under the Financial Planning and Policy Committee. Uh, I have the language here for the motion. So when we get there, I'll read the motion and then someone can say I moved and I second and we'll take a vote after that. And then the only other item you have on the agenda I had to use an amendment to the licensing agreement that we have with the uh, group that runs the restaurant at the golf course. As the golf committee has discussed, uh, that has uh, their, their original agreement uh, ends at the end of this year. We've worked out a one year amendment extension uh, for their agreement. Uh, we've worked into it payment terms that are reflective of the months that they will not be able to be open due to um, COVID restrictions. And um, we, we've been working with them. They've been working with us. It's been a very good relationship. So at this time, uh, we recommend the approval of that for one more year. And that concludes my report. Thank you very much. Any questions for Steve before we move on to committee reports? If not, we'll go back to Brian and the Lakefront Committee. Well, you guys are tired of me. There isn't much. Uh, we already talked about Frisbee golf. We had a, we had a meeting last Monday, Monday night. Uh, Isaac uh, Guts came in with his Frisbee golf presentation. We talked about that. We just talked about the master plan. We got an update on stormwater. Uh, staff is in the process of talking to Smith Group uh, about a, a, a proposal slash contract in order to work on Langdon. That would be the extent of their services, uh, protection of the uh, bluff toe at Langdon. And we, um, Staff is in the, in the process of um, you know, trying to hire a lakefront manager, but I don't expect you know, that it'll be a month or two. So no, nothing imminent on that. That's it. Thank you. Any questions for Brian? All right, on to Parks and Rec, uh, Commissioner Murdoch. Parks and Rec met earlier tonight and just a, a brief comment from some of the public comment a couple of minutes ago. We've heard um, folks suggest that we should do some master planning at some of the parks, uh, similar to what we're doing with the lakefront. First of all, I want to apologize. I, I wanted to point out that uh, while uh, you know, our, our consultants have done an excellent job, they are not cheap. And uh, obviously, Gilson is our, um, um, our crown jewel, and we want to make sure that we plan properly. Um, I want people to understand that there is a significant cost to this process. Um, but in addition, uh, we've started talking about whether it makes sense to do some, some more global planning within the district about how the parks collectively are used in Parks and Rec. It was something that uh, we were going to talk about today, but we'll talk about it at the January meeting. So Parks and Rec really covered three topics tonight, primarily discussion about the play fields, about garden plots, and about dog parks. So with respect to the play fields, obviously this is something we've been talking about extensively for a number of months. Um, there are two primary issues that we're focused on right now. One is um, bathrooms, which I believe the board approved at the last meeting, but did not select a location. Um, or it, I don't recall if the board approved them, actually. I, the Parks and Rec Committee recommended them. Um, but uh, we are still waiting for additional information from District 39 about facilities that are adjacent to the park and under what terms we could use them. and. The committee doesn't feel it's appropriate to make a, a location recommendation with bathrooms until um, we have additional information from them. We do not believe we will have that for the January meeting, so most likely this conversation will continue in February or March. Obviously, we're all aware that the, the challenges that the uh, District 39 is, is dealing with, as we are, in some ways greater um, with their student population, so we understand they have other priorities. Uh, but we're hoping to make some progress on that over the course of the next couple of months. We did spend a fair amount of time talking about the, um, the fitness path. And at, uh, at the last meeting of the full board, we, uh, I think there was consensus that we wanted a continuous soft surface and that hadn't been presented. So staff presented four different iterations for that. Um, 
uh, trying to come up with a one mile long loop. Um, at the end of the last Parks and Rec meeting, it looked like that was might not be possible, but staff came up with some great um, possibilities that we may be able to do that. So we asked a few questions, asked for some further refinement, and uh, we'll be talking about that next month. Um, we then shifted to a um, uh, conversation about the garden plots. That's a continuation of sort of a deeper dive that we've done in various um, various operational operations going back over a year. Um, interesting information, I'm not sure everyone was aware, but you know we do have two locations for uh, for our garden plots and at the Centennial location we have um, a, a huge huge waiting list that's almost as large as the the number of plots we have and some people have been on that waiting list for years and years. So we uh, um, we were given an update about the current program and then asked staff to look at potentially adding additional capacity at other locations uh, considering an increase in fees maybe as a, a market clearing mechanism can't help but throwing in some of those economic terms. Um, um, uh, we wanted to maybe take a look at the policy about how people are using their, their garden and if, if, under what circumstances if someone is not actively using their garden, um, where we might be able to, to move along the waiting list. Uh, asking for uh, the staff to, to survey both the folks on the list and uh, um, currently using and on the list uh, to try to find a way to bring down that really substantial waiting list. Um, we, um, uh, we then shifted to uh, potential dog park locations. As most of you are aware, we've had residents come to Parks and Rec meetings over a number of years looking for additional possibilities. Um, we obviously have a great facility over at the lakefront. We have the start of a great facility over at West Park. It's a nice piece of land, um, but it's not currently fenced in doing, due to some entitlement issues with the village of Glenview, which uh, technically owns the land, but we're working our way through that process. But uh, even when we have those two parks really on the far extremes of the, the village, um, a number of residents would like to see something um, closer in town. So we, uh, we asked staff to come back and look at three specific locations, each of which would be at least a quarter acre in size, uh, the community play fields, Howard Park and Centennial. And the hope is that we'll be able to identify um, a third dog run dog park location um, that, uh, that we could recommend for the full board to consider sometime early in 2021. Um, during the uh, staff reports, I just want to part, highlight a couple of things. Um, first off, um, uh, we are, the staff is doing a great job of trying to continue a lot of our activities that are COVID restricted. Um, you know, for example, the, the Santa letters that we've historically done inside are out at the gazebo at Mallinckrodt Park. And if you haven't been over there to see it, I think there's some pictures in the board packet. Um, really, really cute, and apparently um, a lot of folks have uh, dropped off ladders to Santa, and as um, uh, Superintendent Gwynn had, Gwynn had, had suggested, we're simply just the, the, the delivery folks, but we do get those letters to Santa so the, the kids can um, um, uh, hear back from Santa, hopefully in the not too distant future. Um, Want to point out that staff, again, given that we had some really nice weather in early December, created some uh, pop-up sports classes, not sure exactly what the, the revenue impact was, but I'm sure it was certainly positive. And again, just another example of the staff really going above and beyond to meet the needs of our community. And finally, in a similar vein, because the, uh, the paddle program is different this year with a large, a long midwinter break because all the facilities are closed. Um, Jason and, uh, um, and the racket sports folks are developing sort of a, um, a, a winter interim season, sort of an in-house league for folks that can't get enough of paddle. Um, so that's my Parks and Rec report and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Mike, Mike, I'm sorry. Uh, yes. Uh, we might wanna consider, we know there's gonna be two options for the bathroom in a sense that we're either gonna get access to the bathrooms at the junior high or we're not, right? And so should, just to keep things moving along, should we just assume one and then where would we put it and then assume the other and where would we put it? So at least we're still moving forward rather than waiting uh, and then having to move forward after that. Just throwing that out there as, as something to just keep the process moving. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to hear from the other commissioners. I'm not sure um, I would support that idea simply because this is a very contentious issue with 
um, with several of the neighbors, especially depending on which location it might be. And uh, um, we do have four different locations that we've considered to this point, I think a, potentially a hybrid fifth. Um, it was my opinion, and I think the other committee members, but they can chime in too, um, that really um, it makes sense to know whether or not we're going to have access to that and then determine you know, one location and move forward. I think it muddies the water. That's my personal opinion, but I'm open to hearing from other folks as well. Well, I think I've also I've also asked the staff like where where the most uh, activity occurs in the park, and that that also plays into the to the the decision for, to some extent. Thanks, Cecilia. We need that data. We're waiting on that data as well. Thank you. Yeah, and I agree with Cecilia. The other thing I would notice would we, as we look at what D thirty nine is able to to extend to us, I think we should also consider what kind of condition that restroom is, and you know what size and space it offers. Um, I think one of the important things is um, we need to consider if that's available to us, what does that gain? And then if not, what are the alternatives? So I look forward to hearing the outcomes as well. I think one other critical piece is where, uh, if we put a path in, more than likely we will, but if we do put a path in where that would be and how that impacts where a bathroom would go as well. So I think it all kind of plays together in conjunction that we need to be aware of all these parts before making any decisions, at least that's my feeling. And then I would just add, I'm, um, I, as a dog owner, I'm sure you've thrilled a lot of dog owners who might be uh, in the crowd watching this. Um, I would also just note when we consider where the dog run might be is where do people currently gather? What, you know, what availability is there from you know, walking to parks? So look forward to the outcome of the staff's decisions. All right, I think I'm all done. All right, sounds great. Thank you, Mike. Uh, we've got the Golf Operations Committee, Commissioner Wolf. Yes, uh, Golf Operations Committee met on Monday, uh, November 23rd. We had uh, some updates from Adam and Nick. It sounds like the golf course is still running and doing quite well. Um, well, at that point it was, sorry, but we had our meeting <laughs> still running and doing quite well. Um, they had a super busy month in November. They had 2,700 rounds of golf in November at the point when we had our meeting compared to around 250 to 300 normally in the month of November. So they were very happy with the amount of play that they got in November. They were averaging at the time around 41,000 rounds for the year, which is much higher than normal. Um, the cart path project is underway. I'm not sure exactly how far it got before things got a little cold here, but at that point that had gotten started. The Nick had mentioned that they'd done their last few cuts of the grass and getting it ready for winter and getting it winterized. Um, they've added some tile drainage, uh, drain tile, excuse me, had been installed to help with the water on the course and hoping that that'll improve play going into next year. And finally, they had done some top dressing fertilizer, mold prevention were all being put down before the first winter snow, getting the course to be able to be ready played as soon as it gets, as it gets warm in the spring. So that was about it for the golf committee. Any questions? Thanks. All right. Commissioner Goebel, Financial Planning yep. and Policy Committee. Yes, the Financial Planning and Policy Committee meeting occurred on Monday, November 16th. Uh, we covered a number of topics. Uh, this meeting in particular you know, is a part of the continuum of our budget planning discussion, which occurs throughout the fall and was just concluded last Wednesday. So thank you to everyone involved in that particular process. Um, in this meeting, we discussed um, a couple of key items, both the October income statement and the projection for the balance of the year. Um, as you'll see in this packet, um, Superintendent Foy outlines the surplus that is anticipated and um, you know, I think it, again, speaks to careful management in a very difficult year for everyone. So thank you for all involved in that. Um, would also note we discovered, we discussed capital spend planning for, uh, for the new year, uh, for the rest of the year, as well as into the new year. Um, it, you know, we always have the life safety issues that we must cover um, from a capital investment perspective, but also looking at what needs to happen ahead of, uh, in, the, in the next several years. Um, and then finally, we covered the 2020 tax levy, um, reviewing it by each fund. Um, in, in particular, uh, as noted earlier in the meeting, um, the, uh, the guidance of the committee and ultimately approved by the board was to um, 
keep the, uh, the tax rate unchanged, which eff eff effectively resulted in a negative um, tax increase. So uh, once again, thanks to all the committee members. We appreciated everyone's work and of course the work of the staff this year. Uh, we have no further meetings in, uh, in 2020 and we'll regroup again in January. Sounds great. Any questions for Commissioner Goble? I think we just have a couple motions for this committee that I'll mm -hmm. read if we're ready for those. I think we are now. Great. So I'm looking for a motion to approve ordinance 2020-0-4, an ordinance providing for the levy and assessment of taxes for the Wilmette Park District, Cook County, Illinois, for the calendar year beginning January 1st, 2020 and ending December 31st, 2020. So moved. Second. And I just want to clarify the motion. Remember, this is the 2020 tax levy collected in 2021, which is why the motion was talking about dates of January to December 2020. Thank you. Any other discussion or should I do a roll call? Absent discussion, let's do the roll call. Roll call it is. Commissioner Abbott. Yes. Commissioner Murdoch. Yes. Commissioner Schisler. Yes. Commissioner Clark. Yes. Commissioner Wolf. Yes. Commissioner Goble. Yes. Commissioner Anderson. Yes. The ordinance is approved. And then uh, just more of a procedural motion. Uh, whenever we do the tax levy, we also do a related resolution that directs the county that if for some reason we've over levied our taxes against any of the various limiting rates, how we wish for them to reduce our levy and we direct them to reduce it within our corporate fund, which is our largest, uh, most flexible uh, form of, of our funds that we account for. So it would be a motion to approve the resolution 2020-R-4, a resolution directing the manner of any reduction of the aggregate extension of the 2020 tax levy of the Wilmette Park District, Cook County, Illinois, in order to comply with the property tax extension limitation law as recommended by the Financial Planning and Policy Committee. So moved. Um, second. Uh, any discussion? Then I'll move right into roll call vote. Commissioner Abbott? Yes. Commissioner Murdoch? Yes. Commissioner Schisler? Yes. Commissioner Clark? Yes. Commissioner Wolf? Yes. Commissioner Goble? Yes. Commissioner Anderson? Yes. Resolution is approved. Thank you very much. Moving on, unfinished business. Anything to talk about? Great, all right, moving on to new business. Uh, we've got the uh, 2021 board meeting schedule. Would that also include the committee meeting, Steve? It, it did, but I, I actually would recommend we, we don't include that as a part of our official approval. The board meetings are really set and don't move around and we, we contemplate those in advance around holidays. Committee meetings move based on, on a many factors. So I, I think we should publish our, our general schedule on our website, but you don't need to include it as a part of the official motion tonight. Well, I, did, I didn't want to publish the parks and rec starting at 6.30 Correct. before board meetings. Correct, that, that's also part, part of it too. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> Says the chair of parks and rec. <laughs> So really it's a, 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 that we want to pass a meeting schedule related to the board meeting as outlined in the document. Basically it's the second Monday of every month at 730. The only exception in 2021 is the October meeting uh, moving to Thursday of that week uh, due to the schools traditionally being off on that Monday. Yeah. Okay. I don't have any issues. And no conflicts with the Yom Kippur or, or Rosh Hashanah this year? I, as I, I checked, I, I never oh, claimed to be perfect, but I checked them and I don't believe there is. Great, okay. I have a couple of comments. Um, first off, with respect to the October 14th meeting, which is in the middle of a week, I would point out that October 18th, I think would be five weeks after the September meeting. Um, I like the idea of keeping these meetings on a Monday. People want to consider that. And then moving back forward to April 12th, um, 
I have a conflict, so I won't be able to vote in favor of the schedule. Um, if we did have that meeting on April 5th, I would point out that that would be four weeks after the March 8th meeting. So just in terms of the timing, in terms of the work that gets done between meetings, I don't think that would be inconsistent. So um, I wanted to make both of those suggestions. Yeah, I don't have any issue with, with moving the October meeting to a Monday instead of a Wednesday. I think it's a Wednesday, right? As it is, I would I would have an issue. Yeah, I would have an issue with moving a, a meeting, the meeting in April, just because a commissioner can't make a meeting. Uh, you know that happens relatively routinely, and it's just something we're not going to move everybody else's schedule around one commissioner. I think, but I think the October, I would, I would support moving it to another Monday. I can tell you, I won't be at the June meeting, but otherwise I'm fine and I will vote for this. Yeah. So is that a consensus to move the proposed October 14th meeting uh, to October 18th? Can I just add, I think we would need to confirm with the village that the council chambers was available. We're presuming we might actually be in person by October. Yeah, I know. I was thinking wrap, that. Wrap your heads around that. Yeah, I sure hope so. I hope so. so. We will, how about we table the motion and we will get the dates together and we will come back next month with it. Can we're, I make good with, we're good with the January meeting though. Mm -hmm. yes, we yeah. are. I just wanted to make one point too. There is an election for the park board and so schedules obviously of new commissioners will be <laughs> Um, coming into play at the second half of the year. So, another reason why the committee meetings are, are in potentially in flux. So, Amy, it's not too late for you. I just want to point that out. <laughs> oh, it's too late, but thank you. <laughs> so, are we okay tabling this, or do you all want to make a motion, amend the document? How do you want to move forward? Let's just table it. I say table. I, do any of the commissioners have an issue with with moving the October to a Monday? No. Mm, no I, issue no. pending Libby's no. comment that yeah. the, the yeah. space is available. We could yeah. probably move to approve the first quarter. If, yeah. uh, if we have to hold off, that will at least buy us through the time of um, leading up to the, the election in the spring. Yeah, yeah. L L Libby, is there much of a chance of the room not being available? I'll jump in. I don't believe there is. Monday night tends to be a, a night that's free, which is why when the original that's Monday true. night in October wasn't mm -hmm. available, we waited till Thursday the 14th because Tuesday and Wednesday tend to be when board and zoning board meetings in that room are taking place. Uh, so I think Monday will likely work. So mm -hmm. if the, the board wants to make a motion approving the schedule as presented with the amendment of October 14th to October 18th, we're fine with that as well. If something comes up, we'll obviously uh, notify everyone as to every meeting date. We put out a calendar every month anyway. So doing this is really more procedural than required. Yeah, yeah. I, I, my recommendation would be just let's get it done and, and make the change and, and uh, you know, get it off the agenda and move on. I'd go along with that. I just think it makes sense to me. Okay, then uh, motion to approve the Board of Park Commissioners schedule as presented in the packet with the change of October 14th to October 18th. Yeah. I'll move. I'll move. Second. And a roll call vote. Commissioner Abbott? Yes. Commissioner Murdoch? Yes. Commissioner Schisler? Yes. Commissioner Clark? Yes. Commissioner Wolf? Yes. Commissioner Goble? Yes. Commissioner Anderson? Yes. Board meeting schedule approved. Uh, excellent. Okay. All right. Next item is the uh, the amendment to the food and beverage concession license agreement between a la carte, I think, Grill and uh, Lomet Park District. Who wants to speak to that? Anyone have it? Should I make the motion first I'm, and then people can discuss? Sure. 
Okay, a motion to approve the first amendment to the food and beverage concession license agreement between uh, Cart Grill, Inc. and yeah. Wilmette Park District. So moved. Second. Note that they go by a la carte, but their incorporation name is. Uh, a is uh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Mm. Okay. I had no comments. So just so everybody knows, this this is the same concession we've had there for the past three years. Given the coronavirus situation, we thought it was prudent to just continue with yeah. the, the service that they've been giving us um, with the attached agreement. And then obviously we'll revisit this or the committee will revisit it next year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, and more than likely put together another three year agreement with whomever it might be, but um, just to get us through this next year. So yeah. This is, this is based on a recommendation of the golf committee to go to extend to, to do this. Work. Correct. Yes. Sort of. I think yeah, just a couple did, of things. We didn't really come, yeah, we didn't right. really have like a consensus or anything, but we right. kind of discussed it and staff, you know, recommended it as well. So I think that's kind of where we ended up. <laughs> Look, I'll put it this way. I'm not hearing anybody tell me not to do this. So Sure. So I have a couple of questions and comments. Um, first off, just want to point out that I think the committee did recommend that um, we should include in the agreement a provision that the park district is not obligated to rent from a la carte given all of the money that we've spent building the facility. Um, I don't see that change in the agreement. I think that's fine for this year, but I think it's something to, uh, to incorporate in, in future agreements, again, given the size of the investment we've made in the facility. Um, secondly, we, we have talked about, kicked around some different potential changes down the road that might make the operation more efficient for whoever the vendor is, which might then allow for some, um, some larger fees to the district. And we can take a look at that over the course of the next year. Um, and then finally, I guess I would just ask, what is the fee change this year um, from last year? I certainly understand that there's a, a COVID factor, but I think that... Uh, um, there was a reference that we removed um, subsection 6.A um, and replaced it with a revision. I'm just wondering what the old agreement said or, or what the financial change is before we vote on this. Uh, the subsection, I believe, that you're seeing, subsection 6, I think it um, was removed and replaced because specific dates uh, that are now expired. So that's why a new table is in there and these are the same monthly rates that they're paying currently. Great, thank you for clarifying that. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or shall we take a roll call vote? Okay. All right. Roll call. Commissioner Abbott? Yes. Commissioner Murdoch? Yes. Commissioner Schisler? Yes. Commissioner Clark? Yes. Commissioner Wolf? Yes. Commissioner Goebel? Yes. Commissioner Anderson? Yes. The amendment is approved. Thank you. Could I get a motion to adjourn and a second, please? I'll move, move to adjourn. Absolutely. Check <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it. out, let me. Ooh, I would like to thank right. you all for it's, your it's... quick motion to adjourn. I just won the under. Uh, Commissioner Abbott? <laughs> yes. Commissioner Murdoch? Yes. Commissioner Schistler? Yes. Commissioner Clark? Yes. Commissioner Wolf? Yes. Commissioner Goebel? Yes. Commissioner Anderson? Yes. And it's like uh, 9 59 59 for... p.m. We are adjourned. You all have a great Yay. evening. Yay. Good night.